The change from wishing fellow Americans Merry Christmas to wishing them Happy Holidays is a very significant development. Proponents of Happy Holidays argue it's no big deal. Proponents of Merry Christmas are making a mountain out of a molehill. But the Happy Holidays advocates want it both ways. They dismiss opponents as hysterical, but at the same time, in addition to replacing Merry Christmas with Happy Holidays, they have relentlessly pushed to replace Christmas vacation with winter vacation and Christmas party with holiday party. So then, which is it? Is all this elimination of the word Christmas important or not? The answer is obvious, it's very important. That's why so much effort is devoted to substituting other words for Christmas. And these efforts have been extraordinarily successful. In place of the universal Merry Christmas of my youth, in recent decades I have been wished Happy Holidays by every waiter and waitress in every restaurant I have dined, by everyone who welcomes me at any business, by my flight attendants and pilots, and by just about everyone else. When I respond, thank you, Merry Christmas, I often sense that I've actually created some tension. Many of those I wish Merry Christmas are probably relieved to hear someone who feels free to utter the C word, but all the sensitivity training they've had to undergo creates cognitive dissonance. The opponents of Merry Christmas and other uses of the word Christmas know exactly what they're doing. They're disingenuous when they dismiss defenders of Merry Christmas as fabricating some, quote, war on Christmas. Of course it's a war on Christmas. Or more precisely, a war on the religious nature of America. The left in America, like the left in Europe, wants to create a thoroughly secular society. Not a secular government, which is a desirable goal and which in any event has always been the case in America, but a secular society. Most people do not realize that the left believes in secularism as fervently as religious Jews and Christians believe in the Bible. That's why Merry Christmas bothers secular activists. It's a blatant reminder of just how religious America is and always has been. So here's a prediction. Activists on the left will eventually seek to remove Christmas as a national holiday. Now, the left doesn't announce that its agenda is to thoroughly secularize American and European societies. Instead, they offer the inclusiveness argument that Merry Christmas or Christmas party or Christmas vacation is not inclusive. This inclusive argument plays on Americans' highly developed sense of decency, but the argument is preposterous. Who exactly is being excluded when one wishes someone Merry Christmas? Non-Christians? I'm a non-Christian. I'm a Jew. Christmas is not a religious holy day for me, but I'm an American, and Christmas is a national holiday in my country. It is therefore my holiday, though not my holy day, as much as it is for my fellow Americans who are Christian. That's why it's not surprising that it was an American Jew, Irving Berlin, who wrote White Christmas one of America's most popular Christmas songs. In fact, according to a Jewish musician writing in the New York Times, almost all the most popular Christmas songs were written by Jews. Apparently, all these American Jews felt quite included by Christmas. By not wishing me a Merry Christmas, you are not being inclusive. You are excluding me from one of my nation's national holidays. But even if Christmas were not a national holiday, I would want pilots to wish their passengers Merry Christmas, companies to have Christmas parties, and schools to continue to have Christmas vacations. Just because I don't personally celebrate Christmas, why would I want to drop the word Christmas when the holiday is celebrated by 90% of my fellow Americans? It borders on the misanthropic, not to mention the mean-spirited, to want to deny nearly all of your fellow citizens the joy of having Christmas parties or being wished a Merry Christmas. The vast majority of Americans who celebrate Christmas and who treat non-Christians so well deserve better. So please say Merry Christmas 
and Christmas party and Christmas vacation. If you don't, you're not inclusive. You're hurtful. I'm Dennis Prager. I live in Guatemala and I work throughout Latin America. And I want to speak to the millions of fortunate Hispanic immigrants living in the United States, legally or not. I have a question for you. Why do you support the same policies in the US that cause you to flee your home country? The policies I'm talking about are those that lead to a bigger and bigger central government. You know only too well that the more power the government has, the more corrupt it becomes. My home country, like most other nations in Central and South America, is very poor. 54% of the population lives in poverty, and 13% live in extreme poverty. Half of all children under five are chronically malnourished. Crippling government corruption is the norm. Opening a new business can take months, even years, because of a multitude of regulations that are designed to line the pockets of bureaucrats. So the cost is much too high for the average citizen. Quite simply, unless you're politically connected in Guatemala, you probably want to leave. And in the last 20 years, many Guatemalans have left. Or to put it more honestly, they fled. The fortunate ones reached the United States, the freest and wealthiest nation in human history. There are at least one million Guatemalans living in the US. Nearly every Mexican and Central and South American immigrant in the United States, whether they immigrated legally or illegally, moved or fled to the US for the same reasons, economic opportunity and the freedom to shape their own lives. In short, you came to the United States to participate in what Americans call the American dream. But have you ever asked yourself, why is the United States so free, so much less corrupt, and so much more affluent than any Latin American country? The answer lies first and foremost in the unique American belief in limited government. Why? Because the smaller the government, the less the corruption, and the smaller the government, the more individual freedom and personal responsibility. And given those things, along with hard work and talent, you can accomplish your life's goals. So back to my question, why would you support policies that keep expanding the power of the government when they are the very policies that doom your home countries? Is it because you think that when Democrats offer you free stuff, it means they really care about you? Do you think that when Republicans talk about enforcing immigration laws, it means they are going to send you back? Let's be honest, you didn't come here for free stuff. You came for the economic opportunity that allows you to work and earn. And of course, a nation has an obligation to enforce its borders. Certainly, every country in Central and South America does. In fact, much more so than the US. Perhaps you believe that your home country is poor not because of failed socialism and corrupt big government, but because of issues unrelated to ideology. Not enough natural resources, imperialism, and so on. Or worse, you believe that the US has gotten rich on the backs of poor nations. But these narratives are false. There are many nations blessed with abundant natural resources that are poor. And they are poor overwhelmingly because of corrupt governments and policies that destroy incentives to produce. Look at Venezuela, which has vast oil and mineral reserves, but has shortages of every basic necessity. Why? Because of socialist policies, because of those same deceiving politicians who promise to fight for the people and give you free stuff. And you're going to fall for these lies again in your adopted country? Do you think by electing politicians who will fight for the people, fight for social justice, and raise taxes on the 1% who are exploiting the wealth of the 99% that you will get ahead? In other words, will you support the same policies and vote for the same types of politicians here who made such a mess back home? The United States became wealthy because its government stayed out of the way of its citizens. The more power you give to the government, the less power you have to control your own life. Prosperity and opportunity diminish as government grows. 
So why did you, like so many of my fellow Guatemalans, come to the U.S.? Because your society was broken. You chose to make a new life in the United States. You could have gone to another Latin American country with a similar culture and the same language as your home country, but you didn't. Because the United States is different. Please, help keep it that way. I'm Gloria Alvarez, author of The Populist Deception for Prager University. College commencement addresses often are collections of bromides and boring advice. You know what I mean. Go forth, graduates, and save the planet. You are the nation's hope. You have worked hard and learned much from devoted faculty. And don't forget to floss and to use sunscreen. Boring. Just once, a commencement speaker should puncture the smug complacency and cloying self-congratulation on campuses. Someone should give the following commencement address. Members of the graduating class, you who are about to receive your diploma should also receive an apology from this university and a refund of a large portion of the tuition you have paid. You have been cheated, bilked, propagandized, and badly educated. Your tuition has been much too costly, for which you can blame the federal government and the avarice of the university. Washington has produced a bubble in higher education just the way it produced the bubble in housing. Some government planners decided that too few people owned homes. So the planners decided to force an increase in home ownership. They lowered lending standards for people seeking a mortgage. This produced a glut of subprime loans and subprime borrowers. And then a crash. Next, some government geniuses decided that there were too few college students. So government made student loans and other tuition subsidies easier to get. Of course, colleges and universities responded by increasing tuition to capture these government subsidies, which is why the cost of college has been rising four times faster than the rate of inflation. The cost of college has increased faster than the cost of health care. There is now well over a trillion dollars of student loan debt. There is more student loan debt than credit card debt or than auto loan debt. Most of you are graduating today with debt. In effect, you are graduating with a mortgage, but no house. And what did you get for all this expense? A subprime education. Today's students study many fewer hours a week than students did a generation ago, but they are getting higher grades. This, too, is a result of government creating perverse incentives. The government money gives colleges and universities a powerful incentive to admit more and more students. Inevitably, this means more and more students who are marginally qualified or unqualified. Many of these will pay tuition for a few semesters and then leave school with debt but no degree. Others will plod along, paying tuition, piling up debt, and eventually getting a degree, but not in four years. You have seen the t-shirts that read, College, the best seven years of my life. Those of you who majored in gender studies, or women's studies, or ethnicity studies, or cinema deconstruction, or any other of today's academic fads, to you I have this advice. When this commencement ceremony is over and you take off your cap and gown, do not bother looking for a job. Instead, go straight to the unemployment office. This university did not equip you to add value to the American economy. Soon, this university's office in charge of alumni giving will ask you for money. Your response should be, are you kidding? Instead of sending money to this university, just send a schedule of your student loan repayments. If this campus is like most campuses, you have been living in a community of enforced conformity. When you leave and enter the real world, you are in for a shock. If this is a typical campus, it has a speech code. It has forbidden and punished speech that did not conform to fashionable political pieties. If this is a typical campus, it has used its speech code to teach you that you have a special entitlement, that you are entitled to pass through life without hearing any speech that annoys, depresses, confuses, offends, or otherwise distresses you. If this campus is like many campuses, 
It has a free speech zone, a small, isolated, inconvenient space where students are allowed to exercise First Amendment rights. But guess what? Off campus, out in reality, no one recognizes this entitlement. You are going to discover that the Constitution makes the rest of America, all of it, a free speech zone. This school has restricted speech in order to protect your tender sensitivities and to protect your feelings from being hurt. When you leave this campus, you will have to unlearn the silliness you have been taught here. The idea that you deserve to be treated as a frail flower. So, graduates, you have been saddled with debt and bad ideas. Good luck. You are going to need it. There. That would be a commencement address worth hearing. But a university sensible enough to invite such a speaker would be a university that does not need to hear such an address. I'm George Will for Prager University. I'm always telling my daughter stories from when I was a kid. By comparison, the world of my youth was rougher and meaner than the world that kids grow up in today. So here's my question. Did this rougher and meaner world better prepare me to be a well-adjusted, happy adult? I say yes. When I was a kid, you could say we were less sensitive about a lot of things. I mean, just look at the commercials we watched. We had the Frito Bandito, the cartoon spokesman for Fritos. He was a three and a half foot tall Mexican thief. Can you imagine pitching that at an ad agency today? Aha, uh -huh, the uh, Frito Bandito, okay. Um, all right, Phil, you don't work here anymore. Yeah, you gotta go clean out your desk right now. Some were violent. Hawaiian Punch, every commercial was the same. A cartoon Hawaiian character walks up to an unsuspecting cartoon tourist and says, hey, how about a nice Hawaiian Punch? Sure, says the tourist, which gets him punched directly in the face. We all thought that was hilarious. Kids had to be tougher then, too. An occasional playground fight was expected. And as for teasing, my mom had a remedy for that. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. She used to say that all the time. One of the seemingly endless adages she had at her disposal to deal with any of life's problems. But I think long and hard about the practical applications that statement had on my life. That's true, I thought. If someone punches you in the chest, it hurts no matter what. But with words, it all depends on how you think about it. You could actually choose whether or not to be hurt. You can't choose whether or not a punch hurts, but you can choose whether or not words hurt. That was huge. Even though it had been repeated ad nauseum for generations, sticks and stones really was a powerful bit of philosophy to a kid. That's one of the great things about being a parent. You can spout cliches till the cows come home, and yet, to your child, it's all new. You come off as one of the great thinkers in Western culture. But does anyone really say sticks and stones anymore? I doubt there's a grammar school teacher today who's even allowed to utter that phrase. They're much more likely to warn against the ever-present danger of hate speech or triggers or hurting people's feelings. This is done in the name of teaching children to respect each other. It begins innocently enough by trying to eradicate teasing, but it continues into middle and high school where there's no greater sin than offending someone's personal or cultural sensitivity. We've seen what used to be called great books banned because of fear of offending. That would not have even occurred to us years ago. Of course, how could the physical abuse in The Great Gatsby harm us in high school when we spent our childhood watching Jerry the Mouse staple gun Tom the Cat's tongue to the wall? How could reading an honest depiction of racial attitudes in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn harm us when we sang ay 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 along with the Frito Bandito? Or fat kids, skinny kids, kids who climb on rocks, tough kids, sissy kids. They said sissy kids. Even kids with chicken pox. We sang that along with the Armor Hot Dog Kids on our TV sets. Now people look back and some feel ashamed that teasing was expected in childhood. And stereotypes were commonplace in our culture. But was growing up in that environment worse than the hypersensitive culture we live in now? I look at the rough and tumble of childhood, 
and the process of learning to deal with bullying and being insulted as a process of inoculation. After each instance of being offended and then repeating my mother's sticks and stones philosophy, it was like a vaccine that built up my immune system. Eventually, you're resistant. And often, you weren't even aware it was happening. I can't imagine my college-age self living in fear of microaggressions. Yet today, there are full-time campus administrators whose job involves scrubbing the campus curriculum and social life of anything that might offend anyone. And these are college students, ostensible adults, headed into the job market. I don't want to offend anyone with a microaggression if they're holding a scalpel. I try to laugh it off. I don't want my outrage to match theirs. The best thing I can do is tell my stories to my kids and remind them that sticks and stones may break their bones, but names will never hurt them. They think I wrote it. I'm Tom Shalou for Prager University. Is racism still a major problem in America? President Barack Obama certainly thinks so. He said that racism is in our DNA. Really? If racism is in our DNA, doesn't that mean it's immutable, unchangeable? But America has changed, and dramatically so. In 1960, 60% of Americans said they would never vote for a black president. Almost 50 years later, the black man who said racism is in America's DNA was elected president. And four years later, re-elected. That's only the most obvious example of racial progress. There are many others. Take interracial marriage. As William H. Fry of the Brookings Institution wrote, sociologists have traditionally viewed multiracial marriage as a benchmark for the ultimate stage of assimilation of a particular group into society. Black-white marriages were still illegal in 16 states until 1967, and a 1958 Gallup poll found that only 4% of Americans approved of black-white marriages. Today, that number is 87%. In 1960, of all marriages by blacks, only 1.7% were black-white. Today, it's 12% and rising. Now, what about racial profiling and abuse of blacks by police? Doesn't that prove that racism remains a major problem? In the summer of 2014, Ferguson, Missouri became ground zero for this accusation when a white policeman shot and killed an unarmed black teenager. While a Department of Justice investigation of the incident cleared the officer of any wrongdoing, it did accuse the city's police department of racial bias. But what was the Justice Department's report's most headline-grabbing stat? The gap between the percentage of blacks living in Ferguson, 67%, and the percentage of those stopped by police for traffic violations who are black, 85%, an 18-point discrepancy. Racism, right? Not so fast. Blacks comprise 25% of New York City, but account for 55% of those stopped for traffic offenses, a 30-point discrepancy, far bigger than that of Ferguson. Why isn't the NYPD, a department that is now majority-minority, considered even more institutionally racist than the Ferguson PD? The answer is you cannot have an honest discussion about police conduct without an honest discussion of black crime. Though blacks are 13% of the population, they commit 50% of the nation's homicides. And almost always a victim is another black person, just as most white homicides are against other whites. In 2012, according to the Center for Disease Control, police killed 123 blacks while, by the way, killing over twice that many whites. But that same year, blacks killed over 6,000 people Again, mostly other blacks. What about traffic stops? Unlike when responding to dispatch calls, police officers exercise more discretion when it comes to traffic stops. Therefore, racist cops can have a field day when it comes to traffic stops, right? Actually, no. The National Institute of Justice is the research agency of the Department of Justice. In 2013, the National Institute of Justice published a study called Race, Trust, and Police Legitimacy. Three out of four black drivers admitted that they were stopped by the police for a legitimate reason. Blacks, compared to whites, 
were on average more likely to commit speeding and other traffic offenses. The Institute wrote, seatbelt usage is chronically lower among black drivers. If a law enforcement agency aggressively enforces seatbelt violations, police will stop more black drivers. The NIJ's conclusion, these numerical disparities result from differences in offending. In other words, not because of racism. Similarly, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration also found that blacks violate traffic laws at higher rates than whites. In every offense, whether it's driving without a license, not wearing a seat belt, not using a child safety seat, or speeding. Is there still racism in America? Of course there is. But racism is not in America's DNA. Recent history and a lot of research and data prove it. As liberal Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson said, America is now the least racist white majority society in the world, has a better record of legal protections of minorities than any other society, white or black, offers more opportunities to a greater number of black persons than any other society, including all of those of Africa. Patterson, by the way, is black. I'm Larry Elder for Prager University. I'm going to argue for the existence of God from the premise that moral good and evil really exist. They are not simply a matter of personal taste, not merely substitutes for I like and I don't like. Before I begin, let's get one misunderstanding out of the way. My argument does not mean that atheists can't be moral. Of course, atheists can behave morally, just as theists can behave immorally. Let's start then with a question about good and evil. Where do good and evil come from? Atheists typically propose a few possibilities. Among these are evolution, reason, conscience, human nature, and utilitarianism. I will show you that none of these can be the ultimate source of morality. Why not from evolution? Because any supposed morality that is evolving can change. If it can change for the good or the bad, there must be a standard above these changes to judge them as good or bad. For most of human history, more powerful societies enslaved weaker societies and prospered. That's just the way it was and no one questioned it. Now we condemn slavery. But based on a merely evolutionary model, that is an ever-changing view of morality, who is to say that it won't be acceptable again one day? Slavery was once accepted, but it was not therefore acceptable. And if you can't make that distinction between accepted and acceptable, you can't criticize slavery. And if you can make that distinction, you are admitting to objective morality. And what about reasoning? While reasoning is a powerful tool to help us discover and understand morality, it cannot be the source of morality. For example, criminals use reasoning to plan a murder without their reason telling them that murder is wrong. And was it reasoning or something higher than reasoning that led those Gentiles who risked their life to save Jews during the Holocaust? The answer is obvious. It was something higher than reasoning because risking one's life to save a stranger was a very unreasonable thing to do. Nor can conscience alone be the source of morality. Every person has his own conscience, and some people apparently have none. Heinrich Himmler, chief of the brutal Nazi SS, successfully appealed to his henchmen's consciences to help them do the right thing in murdering and torturing millions of Jews and others. How can you say your conscience is right and Himmler's is wrong if conscience alone is the source of morality? The answer is you can't. Some people say human nature is the ultimate source of morality. But human nature can lead us to do all sorts of reprehensible things. In fact, human nature is the reason we need morality. Our human nature leads some of us to do real evil and leads all of us to be selfish, unkind, petty, and egocentric. I doubt you would want to live in a world where human nature was given free reign. Utilitarianism is the claim that what is morally right is determined by whatever creates the greatest happiness for the greatest number. 
But to return to our slavery example, if 90% of the people would get great benefit from enslaving the other 10%, would that make slavery right? According to utilitarianism, it would. We've seen where morality can't come from. Now let's see where it does come from. What are moral laws? Unlike the laws of physics or the laws of mathematics, which tell us what is, the laws of morality tell us what ought to be. But like physical laws, they direct and order something. And that something is right human behavior. But since morality doesn't exist physically, there are no moral or immoral atoms or cells or genes, its cause has to be something that exists apart from the physical world. That thing must therefore be above nature or supernatural. The very existence of morality proves the existence of something beyond nature and beyond man. Just as a design suggests a designer, moral commands suggest a moral commander. Moral laws must come from a moral lawgiver. Well, that sounds pretty much like what we know as God. So the consequence of this argument is that whenever you appeal to morality, you are appealing to God, whether you know it or not. You're talking about something religious, even if you think you're an atheist. I'm Peter Kreeft, professor of philosophy at Boston College for Prager University. Do you wish you had better control over your temper? Do the people around you, your spouse, your friends, your boyfriend or girlfriend, your children, Wish you had better control over your temper? Unfair or excessive anger is a major cause of marital strife, of tensions between parents and children, and of tensions in workplaces. Sometimes anger is responsible for more than just tension. Road rage, for example, is implicated in hundreds of deaths and thousands of accidents each year. Of course, anger is not always wrong. Sometimes it's absolutely necessary. There is evil in the world and sometimes in our own lives. If that didn't make us angry, neither nations nor individuals would ever oppose it. Think about it for a moment. Would you want to live in a world where no one except victims felt anger toward terrorists, rapists, and murderers? But that's not the sort of anger I am talking about now. I'm talking about day-to-day -day anger and the role an angry disposition plays in poisoning our daily lives and the lives of those around us. People with quick tempers sometimes say that they can't control their anger, but that's not true. People can't always control how they feel, but they can almost always control how they act. Let me offer an example. Imagine you're walking down the street when suddenly you're confronted by a person with a weapon demanding your money. No. Clearly, you're furious. But do you shout at the person? Do you curse him? Very unlikely. You speak in as calm a voice as you can, probably even in a respectful manner, if you speak at all. We all know why we would act in such a calm way in order to save our life. Obviously, then, we can control our tempers when we really want to. Now, there are whole courses on anger management, and they undoubtedly have many ideas and suggestions. But I would like to offer one rule that will enable you to control your anger and almost guarantee that you will never say something that will lead to an irrevocable break or a permanent hurt in your relationship with another person. No matter how angry you get, restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. This means when someone has done something wrong and has hurt you, express anger for what they did, but only concerning that incident. Don't use words like always or never. You're always inconsiderate. You never think before you act. What's the other person supposed to say? You're right. I am always inconsiderate. In addition to making the other person defensive, who wouldn't become defensive when accused of always being anything bad, your statement is untrue. No one is always inconsiderate. No one never thinks before he or she acts. 
that someone has done something wrong to you doesn't give you the right to lie to or about them. Also, expressing thoughts like this is destructive in another way. One of the sad and unfair consequences of anger is that people think that what you say when you're angry is what you really think. Now, it might be, but usually it isn't what you really think. It's what you're thinking at that moment. Who hasn't had some really angry and unfair thoughts about their spouse, their child, or about a good friend? No one. But most of the time, we make sure not to express these angry thoughts, because the moment we express them, it becomes hard, if not impossible, for the other person to ever forget what you've said. A medieval philosopher offered wise guidance. I can take back words I didn't say, but I can't take back words I did say. How hard is it to practice this rule? For some, it might be pretty hard. For others, less so. But everyone can do it. You have to stay focused, and you have to exercise self-control. If you have issues with your temper, this might well be a life-transforming suggestion. So let me repeat it one final time. No matter how angry you get, restrict the expression of your anger to the incident that provoked it. I'm Joseph Telushkin for Prager University. We at Prager University understand that America's culture is as important to the nation's health as American politics, and that sport is an important cultural ingredient. So, consider the many reasons why baseball deserves to be the national pastime, the game especially suited to our democracy. First, democracy celebrates ordinary people. Of course, baseball players have extraordinary talents, but most players resemble ordinary people. As a wise baseball man once said, to play baseball, you do not need to be seven feet tall or seven feet wide. And baseball, like America, has a strong independent judiciary, the umpires. In fact, baseball is in one regard better than the rest of America. In baseball, three strikes and you're out. The most expensive Washington lawyers and lobbyists can't help you. And remember, Racial integration came to baseball in 1947, a year before integration came to the armed services, and eight years before Rosa Parks refused to move to the back of the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Today, baseball is a career open to talented people from around the world. About 20% of major leaguers are from outside North America. This is because in baseball, the only race that matters is the race to the base. Baseball is a game of episodes, pitch by pitch, out by out, inning by inning, game by game. Hence, baseball generates an enormous, constantly enriched sediment of numbers. And these numbers make baseball a game that embraces what a free society requires, personal accountability. Every morning during the season, a player will find in the box score a precise record of what he did the day before his runs, hits, outs, strikeouts, errors. If he was thrown out trying to steal second base, the box score will say so. If he failed to drive in teammates who were in scoring position, the box score will announce this failure to the world. In no other sport, in no other profession, is individual performance so unsparingly displayed and dissected. Imagine if, every day, America's lawyers and teachers and business people and journalists had to read in the morning's paper a box score measuring the caliber of their previous day's work. A free society like America is a place where people are free to strive and hence are free to fail. There is a lot of failure in America. Most new business ventures fail. And baseball is a game of constant failure. A player who bats 300 is a star but a star who fails to get a hit 70% of the time. And the teams that lose today must pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and start all over again tomorrow for six months. Which brings us to the number that is hardest for most fans to appreciate. It is not one of the famous numbers of individual achievement, not Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak in 1941, not Ted Williams' 406 batting average, also in 1941. No, the hardest number to comprehend is 162. 
That is the number of games each team plays in about 185 days. Because baseball is the sport of the longest season, it is the sport in which luck matters least. After 162 games, each team is its record. No better, no worse. From the beginning of April to the end of October, the bad bounces and lucky hits even out, which means baseball is what America aspires to be, a real meritocracy. Baseball also is a good game for democracy because it teaches democratic lessons. It is a game of the half loaf. In baseball, as in democracy, no one gets everything he wants. Essentially, all 30 teams go to spring training knowing they are going to win 60 games and lose 60 games. They play the long season to sort out the other 42 games. And every team also knows this. If it wins only 10 out of every 20 games, it is obviously mediocre. But if it wins 11 out of every 20, it will win almost 90 games and have a good chance of playing in the postseason. Which is why in baseball, as in the life of a competitive free society, little differences ultimately make an enormous difference. Baseball also is, as America is, both about individualism and cooperation. The heart of the game is the one-on-one -on -one battle between the batter and the pitcher, but baseball also requires teamwork on offense to move runners another 90 feet, and on defense to make 27 putouts. A wise man once said that there are really just two seasons, baseball season and the void. Happily, the void ends and another season is here. So take yourself out to a ball game and savor all the ways the national pastime illustrates the nation's values. And while you're there, have a hot dog. That's American culture too. I'm George Will for Prager University. I'm an atmospheric physicist. I've published more than 200 scientific papers. For 30 years, I taught at MIT, during which time the climate has changed remarkably little. But the cry of global warming has grown ever more shrill. In fact, it seems that the less the climate changes, the louder the voices of the climate alarmists get. So let's clear the air and create a more accurate picture of where we really stand on the issue of global warming, or as it is now called, climate change. There are basically three groups of people dealing with this issue. Groups one and two are scientists. Group three consists mostly at its core of politicians, environmentalists, and media. Group one is associated with the scientific part of the United Nations International Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC Working Group One. These are scientists who mostly believe that recent climate change is primarily due to man's burning of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas. This releases CO2, carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere, and they believe this might eventually dangerously heat the planet. Group two is made up of scientists who don't see this as an especially serious problem. This is the group I belong to. We're usually referred to as skeptics. We note that there are many reasons why the climate changes, the sun, clouds, oceans, the orbital variations of the earth, as well as a myriad of other inputs. None of these is fully understood, and there is no evidence that CO2 emissions are the dominant factor. But actually, there is much agreement between both groups of scientists. The following are such points of agreement. One, the climate is always changing. Two, CO2 is a greenhouse gas without which life on Earth is not possible, but adding it to the atmosphere should lead to some warming. Three, atmospheric levels of CO2 have been increasing since the end of the Little Ice Age in the 19th century. Four, over this period, past two centuries, the global mean temperature has increased slightly and erratically by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit or one degree Celsius. But only since the 1960s have man's greenhouse emissions been sufficient to play a role. Five, given the complexity of climate, no confident prediction about future global mean temperature or its impact can be made. 
The IPCC acknowledged in its own 2007 report that, quote, the long-term prediction of future climate states is not possible, end quote. Most importantly, the scenario that the burning of fossil fuels leads to catastrophe isn't part of what either group asserts. So why are so many people worried, indeed panic-stricken, about this issue? Here's where Group 3 comes in, the politicians, environmentalists, and media. Global warming alarmism provides them, more than any other issue, with the things they most want. For politicians, it's money and power. For environmentalists, it's money for their organizations and confirmation of their near-religious devotion to the idea that man is a destructive force acting upon nature. And for the media, it's ideology, money, and headlines. Doomsday scenarios sell. Meanwhile, over the last decade, scientists outside of climate physics have jumped on the bandwagon, publishing papers blaming global warming for everything from acne to the Syrian civil war. And crony capitalists have eagerly grabbed for the subsidies that governments have so lavishly provided. Unfortunately, Group 3 is winning the argument because they have drowned out the serious debate that should be going on. But while politicians, environmentalists, and media types can waste a lot of money and scare a lot of people, they won't be able to bury the truth. The climate will have the final word on that. I'm Richard Linson, Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Sciences at MIT for Prager University. Marriage might have been fine for your parents or grandparents, but of what value is it today? Isn't it, as more and more young people seem to be saying, just a piece of paper? Well, it turns out that piece of paper might be the most valuable thing you will ever own. Take the case of Doug Talby. At age 18, Talby worked a minimum wage job operating a press at a factory in Indiana and lived in his parents' basement. I didn't have a care in the world, Talby says. I didn't even have any bills. But after marrying at 19 and having kids, Talby's perspective changed. I had to step up and think about others and start taking care of them. Talby quit his factory job and joined the Army, where he made significantly more money and received housing and health care paid for by the military. Whenever he saw a chance at promotion, he pursued it. It meant more money and benefits for himself and his family. Recently, in a bid to further boost his family's income, he left the Army to work as a finance manager at a car dealership. He's now pulling in six figures. Men who see no need to marry, or who are reluctant to marry until they make more money, could benefit from Talby's discovery. Marriage has a transformative effect on the behavior, emotional health, and financial well-being of adults, especially men. Men who get married work harder and more strategically and earn more money than their single peers from similar backgrounds. Marriage also transforms men's social world. They spend less time with friends and more time with family. They go to bars less and to church more. In the words of Nobel Prize winning economist George Akerlof, men settle down when they get married. If they fail to get married, they fail to settle down. My own research bears out Akerlof's view. Married men work about 400 hours more per year than single men with equivalent backgrounds. A Harvard study also found that married men were much less likely than their single peers to quit their current job unless they had another one lined up. All this translates into a substantial marriage premium. On average, married men earn almost 20% more than their single peers. That's even after controlling for differences in education, race, ethnicity, and other background factors. You can read more about this in my study, For Richer, For Poorer, How Family Structures Economic Success in America. Why is there such a substantial marriage premium? There are at least four important reasons. One, after marrying, men assume a new identity. Marriage is one of the last rites of passage into manhood remaining in our society, argues sociologist Stephen Nock. He found that marriage engenders an ethic of responsibility among men as well as a newfound sense of meaning and status in the world. Two, married men are motivated to maximize their income. 
This means having a different attitude toward their job. They work more hours and make better work choices. Studies find that men increase their work hours after marrying and reduce their hours after divorcing. Sociologist Elizabeth Gorman concludes that married men are more likely to value higher paying jobs than their single peers. Three, there is evidence that employers prefer and promote men who are married. Married men are often seen as more responsible and dedicated workers and are rewarded with more opportunities to advance. Fourth and finally, married men benefit from the advice and encouragement of their wives who have an obvious interest in their success. There is no better motivator than your spouse. The tragedy is that despite all the good news we keep learning about the benefits of marriage, the institution is in retreat. In 1960, 72% of all adults ages 18 and older were married. Today, it's 49%. In 1960, the average age at which men married was 23. Today, it's 29. The consequences of this are negative across the income spectrum, but they are especially so for those in the lower and middle classes. Marriage is a clear path to a better life. It always has been, and now we have plenty of data to confirm it. But if you still don't believe me, just ask Doug Talby and millions like him. I'm Brad Wilcox, Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Virginia for Prager University. There are only two things I can tell you today that come with absolutely no agenda. The first is congratulations. The second is good luck. Everything else is what I like to call the dirty truth, which is just another way of saying it's my opinion. And in my opinion, you have all been given some terrible advice. And that advice is this, follow your passion. Every time I watch the Oscars, I cringe when some famous movie star, trophy in hand, starts to deconstruct the secret of their success. It's always the same thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you don't have what it takes, kid. And the ever popular, never give up on your dreams. Look, I understand the importance of persistence and the value of encouragement, but who tells a stranger to never give up on their dreams without even knowing what it is they're dreaming? I mean, how can Lady Gaga possibly know where your passion will lead you? Have these people never seen American Idol? Year after year, thousands of aspiring American idols show up with great expectations only to learn that they don't possess the skills they thought they did. What's really amazing, though, is not their lack of talent. The world's full of people who can't sing. It's their genuine shock at being rejected. The incredible realization that their passion and their ability had nothing to do with each other. Look, if we're talking about your hobby, by all means, let your passion lead you. But when it comes to making a living, it's easy to forget the dirty truth. Just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you won't suck at it. And just because you've earned a degree in your chosen field, it doesn't mean you're going to find your dream job. Dream jobs are usually just that, dreams. But their imaginary existence just might keep you from exploring careers that offer a legitimate chance to perform meaningful work and develop a genuine passion for the job you already have. Because here's another dirty truth. Your happiness on the job has very little to do with the work itself. On Dirty Jobs, I remember a very successful septic tank cleaner, a multimillionaire who told me the secret to his success. I looked around to see where everyone else was headed, he said, and then I went the opposite way. Then I got good at my work. Then I began to prosper, and then one day I realized I was passionate about other people's crap. I've heard that same basic story from welders, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, HVAC professionals, hundreds of other skilled tradesmen who followed opportunity, not passion, and prospered as a result. Consider the reality of the current job market. Right now, millions of people with degrees and diplomas are out there competing for a relatively narrow set of opportunities that polite society calls good careers. Now, meanwhile, Employers are struggling to fill nearly 5.8 million jobs that nobody's trained to do. This is the skills gap. It's real, and its cause is actually very simple. When people follow their passion, 
they miss out on all kinds of opportunities they didn't even know existed. When I was 16, I wanted to follow in my grandfather's footsteps. He was a skilled tradesman, could build a house without a blueprint. That was my passion, and I followed it for years. I took all the shop classes at school. I did all I could to absorb the knowledge and skill that came so easily to my granddad. Unfortunately, the handy gene is recessive. It skipped right over me, and I struggled mightily to overcome my deficiencies, but I couldn't. I was one of those contestants on American Idol who believed his passion was enough to ensure his success. One day, I brought home a sconce I had made in wood shop. It looked like a paramecium. After a heavy sigh, my granddad gave me the best advice I've ever received. He told me, Mike, you can still be a tradesman, but only if you get yourself a different kind of toolbox. At the time, this felt contrary to everything I believed about the importance of passion and persistence and staying the course. But of course he was right, because staying the course, that only makes sense if you're headed in a sensible direction. And while passion is way too important to be without, it is way too fickle to follow around. Which brings us to the final. Dirty truth, never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. Congratulations again, and good luck. I'm Mike Rowe from MicroWorks for Prager University. Years ago, I interviewed Kwesi Nfume, then the president of the NAACP. As between the presence of white racism and the absence of black fathers, I asked him, which poses the bigger threat to the black community. Without missing a beat, he said, the absence of black fathers. It was President Barack Obama who said, we all know these statistics, that children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, and 20 times more likely to end up in prison. The Journal of Research on Adolescence confirms that even after controlling for varying levels of household income, kids in father-absent homes are more likely to end up in jail. And kids who never had a father in the house are the most likely to wind up behind bars. In 1960, 5% of America's children entered the world without a mother and father married to each other. By 1980, it was 18%. By 2000, it had risen to 33%, and 15 years later, the number reached 41%. For blacks, even during slavery when marriage for slaves was illegal, black children were more likely than today to be raised by both their mother and father. Economist Walter Williams has written that, according to census data from 1890 to 1940, a black child was more likely to grow up with married parents than a white child. For blacks, out-of-wedlock births have gone from 25% in 1965 to 73% in 2015. For whites, from less than 5% to over 25%. And for Hispanics, out-of-wedlock births have risen to 53%. What happened to fathers? The answer is found in a basic law of economics. If you subsidize undesirable behavior, you will get more undesirable behavior. In 1949, the nation's poverty rate was 34%. By 1965, it was cut in half to 17%, all before President Lyndon Johnson's so-called War on Poverty. But after that war began in 1965, poverty began to flatline. From 1965 until now, the government has spent over $20 trillion to fight poverty. The poverty rate has remained unchanged but the relationship between poor men and women has changed dramatically. That's because our generous welfare system allows women, in effect, to marry the government. And this makes it all too easy for men to abandon their traditional moral and financial responsibilities. Psychologists call such dependency learned helplessness. How do we know that the welfare state creates disincentives that hurt the very people we're trying to help? They tell us. In 1985, the Los Angeles Times asked both the poor and the non-poor whether poor women often have children to get additional benefits. 
most of the non-poor respondents said no. However, 64% of poor respondents said yes. Now, who do you think is in a better position to know? Tupac Shakur, the late rapper, once said, I know for a fact that had I had a father, I'd have some discipline, I'd have more confidence. He admitted he began running with gangs because he wanted the things a father gives to a child, especially to a boy. Structure and protection. Your mother cannot calm you down the way a man can, Shakur said. You need a man to teach you how to be a man. In my book, Dear Father, Dear Son, I write about my rough, tough World War II Marine Staff Sergeant Dad. Born in the Jim Crow South of Athens, Georgia, he was 14 at the start of the Great Depression. Growing up, I watched my father work two full-time jobs as a janitor. He also cooked for a rich family on the weekends and somehow managed to go to night school to get his GED. When I was 10, my father opened a small restaurant that he ran until he retired in his mid-80s. He was never angry or bitter and insisted that today's America was very different from the world of racial segregation and limited opportunity in which he grew up. Hard work wins, he told me and my brothers. You get out of life what you put into it. You can't control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before blaming other people, go to the nearest mirror and ask yourself, what could I have done to change the outcome? This advice shaped my life. Fathers matter. Until we have a government policy that makes that its first priority, nothing will change. I'm Larry Elder for Prager University. In this Prager University course, I want to focus not on the evidence for God's existence, but on the benefits of belief. If God exists, then the world didn't just evolve by chance, but by deliberate design. There's an artist behind this incredible work of art, this big and beautiful world. If God exists, we're living in a great story, an epic like The Lord of the Rings, with real heroes and heroic tasks. Ultimately, all the twists and turns of this epic narrative will be paid off. Everything will make sense. It will even have a happy ending. Not necessarily or even likely in our own lifetime. Even Moses didn't get into the promised land but over the grand course of time, in an afterlife, which exists as surely as God exists. If God exists, the presence of evil, hard as it is to accept, makes sense. God allows it for a reason, namely to preserve our free will. And God will reconcile all injustices in the end. If there is no God, life is one big crap shoot. If God does exist, morality is a real, objective feature of the world. If there is no God, morality is just the rules we make up for this little game of life that we play. If God exists, love is the nature of an eternal reality. If there is no God, love is just a fleeting feeling, no more than a bunch of chemical and neurological interactions. If God exists, you are of infinite value. He knows you as a parent knows his child. He's accessible to you. If there is no God, each of us is as insignificant as a rock on an unknown planet. If God exists, death is conquered because if there is a God, there is a reality outside of space and time. If there is no God, there is nothing immortal and all the good things in life are destroyed forever. You and everyone you love and everything you think matters are all consigned to oblivion. If there is no God, life is pointless. Everything we've done and lived for will ultimately be in vain. Can I prove with an absolute certainty that God exists? I can make the case that overwhelming evidence suggests that he does, but no, I can't prove that he exists with absolute certainty. That's likely part of his plan. God deliberately doesn't give us absolute proof so that we're free to choose or not to choose to believe in him. So which way do you want to go? Be honest. Doesn't your heart at least hope that there is a good God, a transcendent validator of love and all the highest human values? Of course it does. Why would anyone not wish that life has some ultimate purpose, that good and evil are real, that there is ultimate justice, 
that our love for others means something. If you choose to live as if there is a God, even if you're not sure that there is a God, you'll lose nothing and you gain everything. Religious Christians and Jews are happier, live longer, and are more charitable than their less observant or secular fellow citizens. These are not my opinions. These are the findings of a multitude of scientific studies. If you've been an atheist for a while, it may be difficult for you to change your thinking, even if you find some merit in the many rational arguments for God's existence. But you can change your behavior. You can live as if God exists, even if you hold doubts. Why not? As I said, you'll lose nothing and you have everything to gain. This behavioral approach is far from new. The Jews have long had a saying, we will do and we will understand, which acknowledges that action often precedes understanding. So why not begin with an action? Why not pray the prayer of the skeptic? God, if you exist, you must know that I am not a believer. So, please, God, give me the gift of faith, in your time and in your way. I want to believe whatever is true. Amen. If you say that and mean it, and give it some time, be prepared, because he will not ignore that prayer. Go on, say it. Find a private place and say it. Your Creator is listening. I'm Peter Kraft, Professor of Philosophy at Boston College for Prager University. In the contemporary world, it's taken as a given that capitalism, with its free market and profit motive, is based on selfishness and produces selfishness, while socialism is based on selflessness and produces selflessness. Well, the opposite is true. Whatever its intentions, socialism produces far more selfish individuals and a far more selfish society than a free market economy does. And once this widespread selfishness catches on, it is almost impossible to undo it. Here's an illustration. In 2010, the United States President, Barack Obama, addressed a large audience of college students. At one point in his speech, he announced that young people will now be able to remain on their parents' health insurance plan until age 26. I don't ever recall hearing a louder, more thunderous, or more sustained applause than I did then. Had the president announced that a cure for cancer had been discovered, it is highly doubtful that the applause would have been as loud or as long. But what were they so happy about? To be told that you can now remain dependent on your parents until age 26 should strike a young person as demeaning, not liberating. Throughout American history, and for that matter, all of Western history, the great goal of young people was to become a mature adult, beginning with being independent of mom and dad. Socialism and the welfare state destroy this aspiration. In various European countries, and now increasingly in the U.S., it is becoming common for young people to live with their parents well into their 30s and not infrequently beyond. And why not? In the welfare state, taking care of yourself is no longer a virtue. Why? Because the government will take care of you. Therefore, socialism enables, and as a result produces, people whose preoccupations become more and more self-centered. How many benefits will I receive from the government? Will the government pay for my education? Will the government pay for my health care? What is the youngest age at which I can retire? How much paid vacation time can I get? How many days can I call in sick and still get paid? How many weeks of paid paternity or maternity leave am I entitled to? The list gets longer with every election of a liberal or progressive or left-wing party. And then each entitlement becomes a right. But we're not done. There are even more destructive effects of socialism. Entitlements create citizens who lack a character trait that every human should have. Gratitude. You cannot be happy if you are not grateful, and you cannot be a good person if you're not grateful. That's why we constantly tell our children, say thank you. 
But socialism undoes that. After all, why would a person be grateful for receiving an entitlement? Who's going to be grateful for getting what they're entitled to? So instead of thank you, the citizen of the welfare state is taught to say, what more am I entitled to? Yet the left insists that it's capitalism and the free market, not socialism, that produces selfish people. But the truth is that capitalism and the free market produce much less selfish people. Teaching people to work hard and take care of themselves and others, and that they should earn what they receive, produces less selfish, not more selfish people. Capitalism teaches people to work more. Socialism teaches people to demand more. Which attitude do you think will make a better society? I'm Dennis Prager. What's the major difference between liberals and conservatives? For liberals, the answer is easy. Liberals are compassionate and conservatives are mean. I am a liberal, public radio host Garrison Keillor wrote in 2004, and liberalism is the politics of kindness. President Barack Obama agrees. Kindness covers all of my political beliefs, he has said. Earlier in his political career, Senator Obama urged college students to broaden your ambit of concern and empathize with the plight of others. If liberalism is the politics of kindness, it follows that conservatism must be the opposite, heartless. New York Times columnist Paul Krugman contends that conservatives want to limit government spending on social welfare programs because they take positive glee in inflicting further suffering on the already miserable. Is this characterization fair? Is it accurate? Hardly. For one thing, helping others, generosity, requires resources to be generous with, to provide needy people tangible assistance, as opposed to inconsequential gestures, requires wealth. And wealth has to be created before it can be donated. This necessity, however, complicates the politics of kindness. Both economic theory and the historical record of different competing economic systems clearly show that the best way to create wealth is to narrow rather than broaden the ambit of our concern. Adam Smith, the founder of modern economics, wrote in 1776, it is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Our natural desire to care more for our families and friends than for distant strangers is not a moral defect, but an advantage. Free markets and voluntary associations, such as churches and civic groups, make the most of this asset. The welfare state tears it down. There is then a glaring contradiction in the politics of kindness. On the one hand, liberals frequently criticize the selfishness of people preoccupied with building careers, businesses, and investments. On the other, liberals are bursting with ideas for all the humane things government can do by redistributing the wealth created by the so-called selfish people. There's another contradiction. Liberals champion government action as the best vehicle to alleviate suffering. At the same time, they are uninterested in the question of whether these government programs actually do alleviate suffering. To take just one example, the government's own studies have demonstrated that the federal preschool program, Head Start, does not achieve its goals. Children enrolled in it are no better off by the end of the first grade than those children who don't enroll. But this program has lost none of its liberal luster. On the contrary, liberals constantly call for its expansion. Our federal, state, and local governments spend more than $3.2 trillion per year on programs designed to prevent or relieve poverty. That's more than $10,000 per American. Yet the official poverty rate has fluctuated in the same narrow range from 11 to 15% of the population for the past 40 years. 
How can the politics of kindness be so cavalier about whether government efforts to alleviate suffering succeed? The problem is not a deficiency of compassion, but the defective moral logic of compassion itself. The word compassion means, literally, suffering together with another. And there's the problem. The whole point of compassion is for empathizers to feel better when the awareness of another's suffering distresses the observer. Oh. But this ultimate purpose does not guarantee that those who are the object of empathy will fare better. So, on top of all of its other problems, our $3 trillion welfare state doesn't work because its liberal architects and defenders don't really care whether it works. The liberal asks, does it feel good? The conservative asks, does it do good? If you really want to help people, it should be pretty obvious which is the more important question. I'm Bill Vogley of the Claremont Institute for Prager University. Carbon emissions are rising and faster than most scientists predicted. But many climate change alarmists seem to claim that all climate change is worse than expected. This ignores that much of the data is actually more encouraging than expected. Yes, Arctic sea ice is melting faster than models expected, but models also predicted that Antarctic sea ice would decrease, yet Antarctic sea ice is increasing. Yes, sea levels are rising, but the rise is not accelerating. If anything, two recent papers, one by Chinese scientists published in January 2014 and the other by US scientists published in May 2013, have shown a small decline in the rate of sea level increase. We are often being told that we are seeing more and more droughts, but a study published in March 2014 in the journal Nature actually shows a decrease in the world's surface that has been afflicted by droughts since 1982. Facts like these are important because a one-sided focus on worst-case stories is a poor foundation for sound policies. Hurricanes are likewise used as an example of things getting worse. But look at the US, where we have the best statistics. If we adjust for population and wealth, hurricane damage during the period of 1900 to 2013 actually decreased slightly. At the UN Climate Conference in Lima, Peru in December 2014, attendees were told that their country should cut carbon emissions to avoid future damage from storms like Typhoon Hagupit, which hit the Philippines during the conference killing at least 21 people and forcing more than a million into shelters. Yet the trend for strong typhoons around the Philippines have actually declined since 1950, according to a study published in 2012 by the Journal of Climate. Again, we're told that all things are getting worse, but the facts don't support this. This does not mean global warming is not real or a problem, but the one-sided story of alarmism makes us lose focus. If we want to help the world's poor, who are the most threatened by natural disasters, it's less about cutting carbon emissions than it is about pulling them out of poverty. The best way to see this is to look at the world's death from natural disasters over time. In the Oxford University database for death rates from floods, extreme temperatures, droughts, and storms, the average in the first part of last century was more than 130 dead every year per million people. Since then, the death rates have dropped 97% to a new low in the 2010s of less than 4 per million. The dramatic decline is mostly due to economic developments that help nations withstand catastrophes. If you're rich like Florida, a major hurricane might cause plenty of damage to expensive buildings, but it kills few people and causes only a temporary dent in economic output. If a similar hurricane hits a poorer country like the Philippines or Guatemala, it kills many more people and can devastate the economy. So let's be clear, climate change is not worse than we thought. That doesn't mean it's not a reality or not a problem. It is. But the narrative that the world's climate is changing from bad to worse is unhelpful alarmism that prevents us from focusing on smart solutions. A well-meaning environmentalist might argue that because climate change is a reality, why not ramp up the rhetoric and focus on the bad news to make sure the public understands its importance? But that's exactly what we've done for the past 20 years. Yet despite dramatic headlines, apocalyptic documentaries, and annual climate summits, carbon emissions continue to rise, especially in rapidly developing countries like India, China, and many African nations. 
Alarmism has encouraged the pursuit of a one-sided climate policy of trying to cut carbon emissions by subsidizing wind farms and solar panels. Yet today, according to the International Energy Agency, only about 0.4% of global energy consumption comes from solar photovoltaics and windmills. And even with exceptionally optimistic assumptions about future deployment of wind and solar, the International Energy Agency expects that these energy forms will provide a minuscule 2.2% of the world's energy by 2040. In other words, for at least the next two decades, solar and wind energy are simply expensive, feel-good measures that will have an imperceptible climate impact. Instead, we should focus on investing in research and development of green energy to lower its costs. So everyone will want it, including China and India. We urgently need a more balanced climate conversation if we ought to make sensible choices and pick the right climate policy that can actually help fix climate change. I'm Bjorn Lomborg, president of the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Here's what I was told during my freshman orientation at Haverford College. Ask for help when you need it. Speak up when you feel uncomfortable. Place your own well-being above all other concerns. In short, the school was ready to protect me from any personal slights or hurt feelings I might suffer. What counted as a personal slight or similar offense was up to me to define. This surprised me. It surprised me because at McDonald's, where I worked before I started school, acting in this way would have probably cost me my job, a job I needed in order to go to college. The most important thing at McDonald's was not how I felt, but how my customers felt. It was my job, and the job of everyone working there, to make others, namely the customers, happy. I worked at the front counter. That meant that if there was a problem with an order, I had to deal with it. The issues weren't complicated. It was usually something like a missing piece of cheese from a McDouble, or whipped cream on a milkshake when they hadn't wanted any. Whatever it was, I had to listen patiently and mentally take notes so that I could report the relevant details to someone who could actually correct the problem. Oddly enough, customers were not interested in carefully crafting their complaints in such a way as to spare my feelings. They were in a rush to get back to work, or they were dealing with their screaming kids, or they had calculated the cost of their meal down to the cent out of necessity and could not afford a mistake. And they had a right to have their meal served the way they ordered it. If a mistake was made, we fixed it as quickly as possible and didn't talk back. Even if I believed the customer had misunderstood some aspect of their order and was actually the one at fault, I was instructed to give the person the benefit of the doubt. Their feelings mattered more than mine. At McDonald's, there was no trigger warning for when a customer was about to start yelling, no safe spaces to go to when the restaurant would get so busy that I barely had time to breathe between orders. When a group of men in the drive-thru would whistle and catcall me as they pulled away, there was no university administrator for me to run to for soothing and reassurance. And from these experiences, the good, the bad, and the flat-out ugly, I grew. Or, to use a word one doesn't see much anymore, I matured. I learned to take care of myself in ways that didn't inconvenience anyone, or draw unnecessary attention to myself, or let my personal problems interfere with the work that had to be done. In short, I had a job to do, and people counted on me to do it. Had I complained to my McDonald's manager that I became anxious when the restaurant was crowded, or that hearing complaints from customers made me nervous, he would have politely handed me my paycheck and shown me the door. I would have gone home and been unable to pay the student contribution from summer work that is built into my financial aid package. So I'm grateful to have worked at McDonald's. It taught me how to better handle my anxiety, how to work with others in pursuit of a common goal. It strengthened my character, my work ethic, and my sense of my own resilience. These are lessons that cannot be learned in the safe spaces of the Haverford campus. Here's one more thing I learned. Putting oneself first is the essence of privilege, but putting oneself first does not develop character or lead to personal growth. Putting others first does. McDonald's is a far better teacher of that lesson than college. I'm Olivia Legaspi of Haverford College for Prager University. Is our economy a machine, like an automobile, a train, or a power plant? One constantly hears phrases such as, the economy is overheating, or needs to cool off, or could use some stimulus. These aren't harmless metaphors. They epitomize how economists have taught us to see an economy, as something that can be manipulated, guided, or driven. And guess who does the driving? 
the government. The government is supposed to make sure that the economy hums along at an even speed, going neither too fast nor too slow. But the economy is not a machine. It is made up of people, and no one can control what billions of them are going to do. What gets overlooked, underplayed, or simply ignored is the extraordinary churn in the activities of a free market. New businesses open, while others close, constantly. In the U.S. during normal times, a half a million or more jobs are created each week, while another half million are cut. Entrepreneurs continually roll out new products and services, most of which flop. But those that succeed can greatly improve our quality of life. What government can and should do is to positively influence the environment in which this hum of activity takes place through sensible taxation, monetary policy, government spending, and regulation. And in almost all instances, the best prescription for economic health is less is more. Catastrophic mistakes by governments can poison the marketplace, as happened during the Great Depression in the 1930s, to a lesser extent in the 1970s, and then again in the panic of 2008-2009. The government's recent mistakes have been compounded by tax increases and an avalanche of anti-growth regulations from Obamacare, the Dodd-Frank Financial Services Bill, and all those Washington regulatory agencies, such as the FCC, the EPA, and the National Labor Relations Board. If you want to understand why the American economy has been growing at the anemic pace of 1% to 2% a year, look no further. Again, the idea of an economy that purrs along like a well-oiled machine hurts, not enhances wealth creation, because invariably it leads to growth-retarding government intervention. Which brings us to bubbles. Shouldn't the government, the argument goes, at least try to stop them from happening? Well, it depends. Those caused by misguided government policies like the housing bubble of the mid-2000s? Yes. Those caused by the free market? No. Bubbles have a bad name, but not all of them are created equal. There are healthy ones and unhealthy ones. The good kind develops when a lot of people simultaneously recognize a great opportunity. Computers are an excellent example. During the early 1980s, there was a boom in personal computers, followed by a severe shakeout, when companies such as Atari and Commodore bit the dust. In the late 1990s, a number of companies recognized the importance of search engines. Google emerged supreme, with Microsoft and others relegated to fractional market shares. More recently, mobile phones went through its own shakeout, with a dozen different brands competing for market share. Once, Nokia was king, but now the Apple iPhone and Samsung dominate. Good bubbles are a sign of a vibrant and innovative economy. The excesses are ultimately squeezed out and capital is redeployed to more promising opportunities. But bubbles artificially created by government policies, such as the housing bubble, are disastrous. The housing crisis was largely created by government policies, including pushing banks into giving mortgages to people who could not really afford them. When large numbers of those borrowers stopped making their payments, the market crashed and everyone got hurt by unnecessary government meddling. Finally, there are business cycles. Shouldn't the government smooth those out? Economists have puzzled over business cycles, the ups and downs of an economy, for more than 200 years. Most have treated the phenomenon like an illness, something to be cured, instead of what it is. The ebb and flow of the free market where what people might want is created and what people don't want is destroyed. Trying to arrest this free market process of creative destruction, as it is known, inevitably leads to stagnation. That is, little or no economic growth. For current examples, see Japan and most of Europe. Here's a rule. The more a government tightens its grip, the less an economy grows. That's because an economy is not a machine and government can't force it to act like one. So, let's free the free market. That is and always has been the surest path to prosperity. I'm Steve Forbes for Prager University. I grew up in the former Soviet Union. My parents and I lived in a communal apartment with nine other families. When my parents wanted to be romantic, they would send me to look out the window. 
One day my dad said, so what do you see in the window? I said, our neighbors being romantic. He said, how can you tell? I said, because their son is looking at me. My parents laughed. At that moment, I felt that I was in the presence of love. As a child, I made the discovery that laughter must be the way people communicate to one another that they're happy. Did you know that there have been actual research into relationship between laughter and happy marriages? For over four decades, Dr. John Gottman, professor of psychology at the University of Washington, has studied thousands of couples in both successful relationship and not so successful ones. Couples who laugh together, he concluded, last together. Here is how it works. We make each other happy first, then laughter reassures us that we're on the right track. The fading away of laughter may be the best way to tell if your relationship has gone off course. So here is what I want you to start doing. Listen for laughter in your relationship. And not just any laughter. Listen for moments when you share laughter together. If that isn't happening just about every day, it's time to do something about it. Let me give you an example from my own life. One night I was putting my son Alexander to bed. He was cranky and crying. My wife said to me, I'll show you how to put the baby to sleep. She took Alexander from me, put him in the bassinet, and put the bassinet on top of the dryer. Two minutes later, he was sound asleep. I said, oh great, all other kids are going to go to daycare center. I have to drop him off at the laundromat. Oh, that bundle? Yeah, that one is mine. <laughs> My wife did not laugh. As a comedian, I should have caught that. In my show, if the joke doesn't get a laugh, I analyze what went wrong, perhaps change the setup or a punchline to get the laughter back. I use laughter as a gauge of the happiness of my audience. At that time, I did not understand that it could be applied to my personal life as well. If I had understood that laughter was a gauge of happiness, I might have saved my marriage. As I started to research the science of happiness, I learned when there is a genuine connection between people, laughter <laughs> is the first thing that happens as a confirmation of a happy relationship. The intimacy comes next, and then people get married and live together. When things are not working, laughter is the first thing to go. Second thing to go is intimacy. Third thing is your house. Of course, marriages and relationships break up for all sorts of reasons, but I can say with confidence, if you're not laughing, there's trouble ahead. So how do you get the laughter back if you've lost it? Every relationship is different, of course, but there's one constant. To laugh together, you need to be together, and that literally means time together. You need to start by making a decision that time together is important and it's not negotiable. Set a date night, take a dance lesson, a cooking class. It doesn't matter what you do, you just have to do it. According to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, American couples sleep on the average 7.2 hours a day, work 8.5 hours a day, and watch television 2.4 hours a day. Then they want to know how much time are we intimate with one another. So they combine hugging, kissing, cuddling, and lovemaking. It was one minute a day. So if you're doing it for 20 minutes, you're using somebody else's minutes. <laughs> and they don't roll over. I believe that you understand the connection between happiness and laughter. You'll be way ahead of those statistics you will have better or even best chance to have a long lasting happy relationship. Just like the gas gauge in your car lets you know how much gas you have in your tank, laughter can let you know how much happiness you have in your relationship. The goal is to live happily ever laughter and maybe make love more than one minute a day. I'm Yakov Smirnov. 
for Prager University. Does the truth matter? Not to groups like Black Lives Matter. That's tragic for many reasons, not the least of which is that black lives are being lost as a result. When it comes to the subject of American police, blacks, and the deadly use of force, here is what we know. A recent deadly force study by Washington State University researcher Lois James found that police officers were less likely to shoot unarmed black suspects than unarmed white or Hispanic ones in simulated threat scenarios. Harvard economics professor Roland Fryer analyzed more than 1,000 officer-involved shootings across the country. He concluded that there is zero evidence of racial bias in police shootings. In Houston, he found that blacks were 24% less likely than whites to be shot by officers, even though the suspects were armed or violent. Does the truth matter? An analysis of the Washington Post's police shooting database and of federal crime statistics reveals that fully 12% of all whites and Hispanics who die of homicide are killed by cops. By contrast, only 4% of black homicide victims are killed by cops. But isn't it a sign of bias that blacks make up 26% of police shooting victims, but only 13% of the national population? It is not, and common sense suggests why. Police shootings occur more frequently where officers confront armed or violently resisting suspects. Those suspects are disproportionately black. According to the most recent study by the Department of Justice, although blacks were only about 15% of the population in the 75 largest counties in the U.S., they were charged with 62% of all robberies, 57% of murders, and 45% of assaults. In New York City, Blacks commit over three-quarters of all shootings, though they are only 23% of the city's population. Whites, by contrast, commit under 2% of all shootings in the city, though they are 34% of the population. New York's crime disparities are repeated in virtually every racially diverse city in America. The real problem facing inner-city Black communities today is not the police, but criminals. In 2014, over 6,000 blacks were murdered, more than all white and Hispanic homicide victims combined. Who is killing them? Not the police and not white civilians, but other blacks. In fact, a police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black male is to be killed by a police officer. If the police ended all use of lethal force tomorrow, it would have a negligible impact on the black death by homicide rate. In Chicago, through just the first six and a half months of 2016, over 2,300 people were shot. That's a shooting an hour during some weekends. The vast majority of the victims were black. During the same period, the Chicago police shot 12 people, all armed and dangerous. That's one half of 1% of all shootings. Does the truth matter? If it does, here's a truth worth pondering. There is no government agency more dedicated to the proposition that black lives matter than the police. The proactive policing revolution that began in the mid-1990s has dramatically brought down the inner city murder rate and saved tens of thousands of black lives. Unfortunately, that crime decline is now in jeopardy. As I write in my book, The War on Cops, police officers are backing off of proactive policing in black neighborhoods thanks to the false narrative that police officers are infected with homicidal bias. As a result, violent crime is going up. In cities with large black populations, homicides in 2015 rose anywhere from 54% in Washington, D.C., to 90% in Cleveland. Overall, in the nation's 56 largest cities, homicides in 2015 rose 17%, a nearly unprecedented one-year spike. Many law-abiding residents of high-crime areas beg the police to maintain order, precisely the type of policing that the ACLU, 
progressive politicians and the Obama Justice Department denounce as racist. This is tragic because when the police refrain from proactive policing, black lives are lost. Lost because of a myth. The best research and data reach this conclusion. There is no evidence that police are killing blacks just because they're black. You now have the truth. Does it matter? I'm Heather McDonald of the Manhattan Institute for Prager University. There's been a lot said and a lot written about income inequality, about how unfair it is that a few people are very rich and the rest of us aren't, that the income gap between the wealthy and even the middle class, let alone the poor, is so large. There's only one problem with this complaint. It's wrong. Income inequality is actually a good thing when it's the product of a free market economy. And your own life proves it. An economy is made up of millions of individuals making decisions about their own lives, where and how much they want to work, what they want to buy, and so on. You are one of those individuals. In a country like the United States, you are free to pursue a path in life that you believe best suits your talents. That talent might be teaching, or making music, or banking, or starting a small business, or raising a family. Whatever it is, this freedom helps to make life enjoyable, exciting, and meaningful. But it's also an expression of inequality. This is simply because we're all different. We have different talents, different temperaments, different ambitions. That's okay because, again, in a free society, we can seek out opportunities that play to our personal strengths, that distinguish us from others. If you find what you're really good at and work hard, you might have great success and make a lot of money. If you're an outstanding athlete, I'll buy a ticket to see you play. If you're a savvy investor, I'll give you some of my money to invest. As long as you have the freedom to guide your own destiny, you have a chance to reach your full potential, achieving success however you define it. But if someone, say a government bureaucrat, told you that your ambition had limits, that there was a ceiling above which you could not rise, I doubt you'd be happy about it. You'd feel like you're in a straitjacket. Forced equality means less opportunity to pursue what makes you individually great. But what about the growing gap between the rich, the 1%, and the rest of us, the 99% that one hears so much about? Isn't that a bad thing? Again, the answer is no. Here's why. In a free market economy, people become wealthy, making what the rich enjoy today into something almost everybody can enjoy tomorrow. The rich are the test buyers. Consider the cell phone. Now we all have them, but when Motorola manufactured the first one in 1983, it was the size of a brick, had a half hour of battery life, reception was terrible, and calls were very expensive. It cost $4,000. But if no one had bought that $4,000 brick, there wouldn't be a $40 cell phone today. In the 1960s, a computer cost over a million dollars. Nowadays, thanks to billionaires like Michael Dell, we have incredibly advanced computers that cost us a few hundred dollars. Remember what an out of reach luxury flat screen TVs once were? Only the rich could afford them. Today your living room is essentially your own private cinema. The free market is about turning scarcity into abundance. What was once available to the few is now available to the many. Wealth and equality is an important corollary to that truth. So, should I resent the people who became wealthy because they have more money than I do? Or should I be grateful for the economic system that allows them to enrich my life and the lives of millions of other people? This feature of the free market, income inequality, can appear terribly unfair. But with a little further investigation, the real picture becomes clear. Income inequality makes what once seemed like impossible luxuries available to almost everyone. It provides the incentive for creative people to gamble on new ideas. It promotes personal freedom and rewards hard work, talent, and achievement. In sum, income inequality signals that individual liberty, opportunity, and innovation are all present in a free economy. Pretty good for something that's supposed to be so bad. Two final points. The 1% Club is always open to new members. And you don't have to be in the top 1% to have a very good life. And that, not the existence of the very wealthy, is what matters most. I'm John Tamney, 
editor of Real Clear Markets for Prager University. What were the religious beliefs of the Founding Fathers of the United States? There's been a lot of controversy surrounding this subject, but there shouldn't be. Because of their prominence, I will discuss George Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin, our nation's first three presidents, and the man referred to as the first American. All of whom, even if some did not individually adhere to Orthodox Christianity, were steeped in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Here's what we can say for certain about their religious beliefs. One, all of the founders believed in a transcendent God, that is, a creator who exists outside of nature. Two, all the founders believed in a God who imposes moral obligations on human beings. Three, all the founders believed in a God who punishes bad behavior and rewards good behavior in an afterlife. The notion that any of the founders believed in an impersonal deity who merely created the universe and then left it to itself is false. All of them believed in a God who, as Franklin said at the Constitutional Convention, governs in the affairs of men. Let's start with George Washington. Washington's writings, both public and private, are full of references to the Bible. This is certainly true during his eight years as the first president of the United States. Here is Washington at his first inaugural. The propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. In all likelihood, Washington was an Orthodox Christian. Like Washington, Benjamin Franklin also referenced Bible verses, stories, and metaphors throughout his life. His calls for prayer at the Constitutional Convention were typical of his attitude. Franklin, who had his own unorthodox views, summed up his faith this way, that the soul of man is immortal and will be treated with justice in another life respecting its conduct in this. While the religious views of Washington and Franklin are clear, those of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson are more complicated. Adams referred to himself as a Christian throughout his life, but did not believe in traditional Christian doctrines such as the Trinity or the divinity of Jesus. Nonetheless, before, during, and after his tenure as president, Adams repeatedly asserted his admiration for the Christian faith. Those general principles of Christianity are as eternal and immutable as the existence and attributes of God, he wrote. Likewise, Adams spoke of his great respect for the Bible, the Bible is the best book in the world. It contains more of my philosophy than all the libraries I have seen. Those who suggest that Adams was against religion like to quote from a letter he wrote to Thomas Jefferson, in which he said, This would be the best of all possible worlds if there was no religion in it. Unfortunately, those who cite this line never quote the lines that immediately follow. But in this exclamation, I should have been as fanatical as the skeptics of religion. Without religion, this world would be something not fit to be mentioned in polite company. I mean, hell. So, those who quote the first line without quoting the subsequent lines are either unaware of the full comment or are deliberately misleading people as to Adams' beliefs. Like Adams, Thomas Jefferson did not adhere to orthodox doctrine. Yet he often declared himself to be a Christian. I am a Christian, he said, in the only sense he, Jesus, wished anyone to be sincerely attached to his doctrines. As one of the leaders of the American Revolution, his views are well known. After all, this is the man who wrote in the Declaration of Independence that all men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You can't get a much more explicit statement of belief than that. These four founders, Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Franklin, were practical men with a sober view of human nature. They understood that man is morally weak and that religion provides the best encouragement and incentive to be good. It does so, first and foremost, by teaching that choices have consequences, not necessarily in the here and now, but most certainly in the hereafter, meted out by a just God. It should come as no surprise, then, that Jefferson, in his second inaugural, asked for the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old from their native land. So what were the religious beliefs of the founders? They were diverse, but all of them were rooted in the Judeo-Christian values found in the Bible. I'm Joshua Charles, writer and researcher at the Museum of the Bible for Prager University. What are the five biggest issues facing blacks in America? Here's my list. Problem number five, the victim mentality. 
Nothing holds someone back more than seeing himself as a victim. Why? Because a victim is not responsible for his situation. Everything is someone else's fault. And the victim sees little chance of improving his life. How can he get ahead if someone is holding him back? All this makes the victim unhappy, frustrated, and angry. This is how too many blacks see themselves as victims. So much so that their victim status becomes their primary identity and their ruling ideology. I call it victimology. Unfortunately, many black churches preach this victimology. Many black parents pass it on to their children. Inner city schools teach it to their students and the black media reinforce it. Meanwhile, the NAACP and other black grievance groups fundraise on it. Problem number four, lack of diversity. Blacks repeatedly demand an honest dialogue or debate about race. But how can there ever be an honest dialogue about race between blacks and whites when there is virtually no honest dialogue between blacks and blacks? It's hypocritical. And if a black doesn't think whites are ultimately responsible for black people's problems, they're labeled a sellout, Uncle Tom, or race trader. As long as this type of groupthink exists, race reverence of the Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson type will continue to be celebrated while independent black thinkers such as professors Thomas Sowell and Walter Williams will be shunned. The honest race dialogue and debate that first has to happen is not between blacks and whites, but between blacks and blacks. We demand diversity from others, but need to practice it ourselves where it really matters in thought, opinion, and even political affiliation. Problem number three, urban terrorism. As just about everyone knows, but too few talk about publicly, in majority black cities, violent black-on-black -black crime is rampant. A Department of Justice study from 1980 through 2008 revealed that blacks accounted for almost half of the nation's homicide victims, 47.4%, and more than half of the offenders, 52.4%, all while being 13% of America's population. The Tuskegee Institute conducted a study of all known lynchings of blacks that occurred between 1882 through 1968. During this 86-year span, which is essentially the post-Civil War era up to the Civil Rights era, 3,446 blacks were reportedly lynched. Presently, black-on-black -black murder eclipses the number of blacks lynched over the course of 80 years, roughly every six months. Unbelievably, the culpability for this disproportionate amount of mayhem actually lies with a menacing 2-3% to 3 minority within the black populace. I call them urban terrorists. And since they're literally spawned from problem number two, the black community protects them. Problem number two, proliferation of baby mamas. The disintegration of the nuclear family has led to an astronomical increase of single mother households. According to the Moynihan Report, in 1965, nearly 25% of black children were born to unwed mothers. The report's author, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, said this was a disaster in the making. He was, of course, vilified by so-called black leaders and their progressive allies. But he was right. Today, the out of wedlock birth rate is nearly 75% and even higher in some urban areas. To be clear, baby daddies share this responsibility with baby mamas, yet, while baby daddies are blamed and rarely shown compassion, baby mamas are rarely blamed and receive both compassion and support. This lopsided dynamic and the previously listed pathology stem directly from the number one problem facing the black community. Problem number one, unquestioning allegiance to so-called progressive policies. Unwavering loyalty to progressive liberal policies is the primary reason these dire conditions persist. It both makes them possible and perpetuates them. It's no coincidence that progressivism is the common thread that binds predominantly black cities where single parent homes, failing schools, rampant poverty, and crime predominate. Look at cities like Detroit, Philadelphia, and Baltimore. They've been run by progressive Democrats for decades. If their liberal policies were at all effective, these cities should have become models of economic growth and prosperity. Instead, they're models of dysfunction. By fostering and exploiting the victim mentality, discouraging self-examination, subsidizing baby mamas, and making excuses for black thugs, so-called progressive policies don't alleviate the problems that afflict the black community. They aggravate those problems. You may have noticed that racism did not make the list. Why not? It's simple. 
There will be no solution to the problems afflicting Black America until more Blacks recognize that the issues plaguing our community are ultimately self-inflicted. Does racism exist? Sure. But there are other problems far more serious. And waiting until there are no more races will mean waiting and making excuses forever. I'm Talib Starks for Prager University. Democratic socialism. It's not the same as socialism socialism because it's democratic, right? Or something, right? People are buying that. People buy that now, right? Apparently. As though adding the word democratic in front of a word changes what it means. Just because we toss something to a vote doesn't change what that something is, nor does it alter whether that something is inherently good or bad. Couple of examples, because I know you'll ask, Hamas was democratically elected as the government in Gaza, despite the fact that the destruction of not only Israel, but the eradication of all Jews is in their official charter. Robert Mugabe, or Bobby Mugabe if you prefer, was democratically elected by a loving majority in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, how's that working out? Venezuela? Well, Hugo Chavez, noted personal favorite and friend of Sean Penn, to whom he constantly pointed as being unfairly characterized as a dictator when in fact he was democratically elected as a socialist. Well, how'd that work out for Venezuela? Well, it's now on the brink of collapse, despite it being one of the most resource-rich nations in the entire world. Basic things like eggs, milk, flour, and toilet paper are either too expensive for the average Venezuelan or simply out of stock. Out of stock, mind you, democratically. I know, some of you will say, well, that's not fair because really we knew all along it technically was a dictatorship. Okay, that's fair. Let's move on to example number two. Denmark? Okay, here's the time where you point to an entirely homogenous population about 1 60th the size of America's and you point to that as the blueprint. Okay, let's go there. This is a place where the middle class can't even afford a car because of the 180% new car tax. And the prime minister was so fed up with Americans pointing to it as a beacon for socialist success that he felt compelled to clarify, I would like to make one thing clear. Denmark is far from a socialist planned economy. Denmark is a market economy. Sweden? I love Sweden. Okay, great bikini team, and thanks to that country, my armor now doubles as a bookcase. Speaking of which, the founder of IKEA, let's be honest, the only really cool export from Sweden, aside from a few good hockey players, left Sweden because of the stifling high tax rate. So, Sweden, good place, not bad people, but a successful model for a viable economy in today's global market? Incorrect. The fact is that over time, the greatest enemy of socialism is reality. The reality that human nature will invariably pull certain people toward individualism and success, and others toward laziness and collectivism. The tension between the makers and the takers always, always leads to socialism's inevitable collapse. But I know that I can give you examples of failed socialist economies until I'm blue in the face, and you won't care. Because at least socialism is inherently more morally altruistic than the evil, greedy, capitalist, warmongering scene in the West. Greed? What's more greedy than wanting to take from someone else something that you haven't earned? Unlike capitalism, free enterprise, which can only occur truly through voluntary transaction, socialism can only occur at gunpoint. That's what it comes down to. If you don't pay your taxes, once you get through the IRS and the auditing and the lawyers and the PR stunts, People make you give the government your money, an increasing amount of your money, the more successful you are, or they send in scary men with guns to take you away. Now, so long as the people having their stuff taken away at gunpoint are in the minority, and the majority feels that they'll get to benefit from more said taken stuff, you'll always be able to win that decision through a popular vote and claim the moral high ground through democracy. Putting the word Democratic in front of your socialism doesn't make it any inherently more moral, nor less violent. Did you get that? American wannabe socialists also. Get a job. Please, like a real job. You'll probably have to shake first. I'm Steven Crowder for Prager University. I want to tell you about an essential vitamin you've probably never heard of. If you're a parent or plan to be one, it might be more important to your child's growth than all other vitamins combined. And only you, a parent, can provide it. I call it vitamin N. The word 
know. More and more children I find are suffering from vitamin N deficiency, and they, their parents, and our entire culture are paying the price. Let me illustrate my point with a story that's quite typical. A father, I'll call him Bill, gave his son, age five, pretty much everything the little boy asked for. Like most parents, Bill wanted more than anything for his son to be happy, but he wasn't. Instead, he was petulant, moody, and often sullen. He was also having problems getting along with other children. In addition, he was very demanding and rarely, if ever, expressed any appreciation, let alone gratitude, for all the things Bill and his wife were giving him. Was his son depressed, Bill wanted to know? Did he need therapy? His son, I told him, was suffering the predictable ill effects of being overindulged. What he needed was a healthy and steady dose of vitamin N. Overindulgence, a deficiency of vitamin N, leads to its own form of addiction. When the point of diminishing returns is passed, and it's passed fairly early on, the receiving of things begins to generate nothing but want for more things. One terrible effect of this is that our children are becoming accustomed to a material standard that's out of kilter with what they can ever hope to achieve as adults. Consider also that many, if not most, children attain this level of affluence not by working, sacrificing, or doing their best, but by whining, demanding, and manipulating. So in the process of inflating their material expectations, we also teach children that something can be had for next to nothing. Not only is that a falsehood, it's also one of the most dangerous, destructive attitudes a person can acquire. This may go a long way toward explaining why the mental health of children in the 1950s, when kids got a lot less, was significantly better than the mental health of today's kids. Since the 50s, and especially in the last few decades, as indulgence has become the parenting norm, the rates of child and teen depression have skyrocketed. Children who grow up believing in the something for nothing fairy tale are likely to become emotionally stunted, self-centered adults. Then, when they themselves become parents, they're likely to overdose their children with material things. The piles of toys, plushies, and gadgets one finds scattered around most households. In that way, overindulgence, a deficiency of vitamin N, becomes an inherited disease, an addiction passed from one generation to the next. This also explains why children who get too much of what they want rarely take proper care of anything they have. Why should they? After all, experience tells them that more is always on the way. Children deserve better. They deserve to have parents attend to their needs for protection, affection, and direction. Beyond that, they deserve to hear their parents say no far more often than yes when it comes to their whimsical desires. They deserve to learn the value of constructive creative effort as opposed to the value of effort expended whining, lying on the floor, kicking and screaming, or playing one parent against the other. They deserve to learn that work is the only truly fulfilling way of getting anything of value in life, and that the harder they work, the more ultimately fulfilling the outcome. In the process of trying to protect children from frustration, parents have turned reality upside down. A child raised in this topsy-turvy fashion may not have the skills needed to stand on his or her own two feet when the time comes to do so. Here's a simple rule. Turn your children's world right side up by giving them all of what they truly need, but no more than 25% of what they simply want. I call this the principle of benign deprivation. When all is said and done, the most character-building two-letter word in the English language is no, vitamin N. Dispense it frequently. You'll be happier in the long run, and so will your child. I'm John Rosemond, author and family psychologist for Prager University. A fundamental difference between left and right 
concerns how each assesses public policies. The right asks, does it do good? The left is more likely to ask a different question. Take the minimum wage, for example. In 1987, the New York Times editorialized against any minimum wage. The title of the editorial said it all. The right minimum wage, zero dollars and zero cents. There's a virtual consensus among economists, wrote the Times editorial, that the minimum wage is an idea whose time has passed. Raising the minimum wage by a substantial amount would price working people out of the job market. Why did the New York Times editorialize against the minimum wage? Because it asked the question, does it do good? But 27 years later, the same New York Times editorial page wrote the very opposite of what it had written in 1987 and called for a major increase in the minimum wage. In that time, the Times editorial page had moved further and further left and was now preoccupied not with the question, does it do good, but with the question, does it feel good? And it feels good to raise poor people's minimum wage. Yes. A second example is affirmative action. Study after study, and more importantly, common sense and facts, has shown the negative effects that race-based affirmative action has had on many black students. Lowering college admission standards for black applicants has ensured a number of awful results. Just to cite one, more black students fail to graduate college. Why? Because too many have been admitted to a college that demands more academic rigor than they are prepared for. Rather than attend a school that matches their academic skills, a school where they might thrive, they too often fail at the more demanding school that lowered its standards to admit them. It's clear that supporters of race-based affirmative action ask, does it feel good rather than does it do good? A third example is pacifism and other forms of peace activism. Many people on the left have a soft spot for pacifism, the belief that killing another human being is always wrong. Not all leftists are pacifists, but pacifism almost always emanates from the left and just about all leftists support peace activism, peace studies, and whatever else contains the word peace. The right, on the other hand, while just as desirous of peace as the left, what conservative parent wants their child to die in battle, knows that pacifism and most peace activists increase the chances of war, not peace. Nothing guarantees the triumph of evil like refusing to fight it. Great evil is therefore never defeated by peace activists, but by superior military might. The Allied victory in World War II is an obvious example. And violent Islamists today need to be killed before they behead, enslave, and torture more innocents. Supporters of pacifism, peace studies, American nuclear disarmament, and American military withdrawal from countries in which it has fought do not ask, does it do good? Because it almost never does good. Did the total withdrawal of America from Iraq do good? Of course not. It led to the rise of Islamic State with its mass murder and torture. Did the American withdrawal from Vietnam do good? No, it led to the violent communist takeover of South Vietnam. On the other hand, because American troops did not leave South Korea, Japan, and Germany, those countries have become three of the most prosperous and free countries in the world. So then, why do liberals support a higher minimum wage if it doesn't do good? Because it makes them feel good about themselves. We liberals, unlike conservatives, care about the poor. Why do liberals support race-based affirmative action? For the same reason. It makes liberals feel good about themselves they appear to be righting the wrongs of historical racism. And the same holds true for left-wing peace activism. It's nice to think of oneself as a peace activist. All this helps to explain why young people are so much more likely to be liberal than conservative. 
They haven't lived long enough to really know what does good. But they do know what feels good. As society moves further and further to the left, so does the preoccupation with feeling good over doing good. The world is getting worse and worse, but many people are feeling better and better about themselves while it does. I'm Dennis Prager. Are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or, for that matter, a tree? One of the biggest differences between Judeo-Christian values and secular values concerns this very issue, the worth of the human being. According to the Judeo-Christian value system, human beings are infinitely valuable. On the other hand, secular humanism devalues the worth of humans. As ironic as it may sound, the God-based Judeo-Christian value system renders humans infinitely more valuable than any humanistic value system. The reason is simple. If there is no God, human beings are only material beings, and therefore not worth anything beyond the matter of which they are composed. But in the Judeo-Christian system, human beings are created in the image of God, meaning that human life is sacred. In other words, we are either created in the image of carbon atoms, and therefore not worth much more than carbon, or we are created in the image of God, and therefore infinitely valuable. Our secular post-Judeo-Christian society has rendered human beings less significant than at any time in Western history. First, the secular denial that human beings are created in God's image has led to humans increasingly being equated with animals. That's why, over the course of 30 years of asking high school and college students if they would first try to save their dog or a stranger, two-thirds have always voted against the person. They either don't know what they would do, or they actually vote for the dog. And many adults now vote similarly. Why? There are two reasons. One is that, with the denial of the authority of higher values, such as religious teachings, people increasingly make moral decisions on the basis of how they feel. And since just about everybody feels more for their dog than for a stranger, many people simply choose the dog. The other reason is that once you get rid of Judeo-Christian values, there's no reason for elevating human worth over that of an animal. That's why people estranged from Judeo-Christian values, including many Jews and Christians, support programs such as Holocaust on Your Plate. Holocaust on Your Plate is a campaign developed by the animal rights group People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, PETA, that teaches that there is no difference between the barbecuing of chickens in America and the burning of Jews in the Holocaust. Why? Because a human and a chicken are of equal worth. So too, in a notorious Tucson, Arizona case, a woman screamed to firefighters that her three babies were in the burning house. Thinking that the woman's children were trapped inside, the firefighters risked their lives to save the woman's three cats. If you think these two examples are either just theoretical, the dog stranger question, or extreme, the Tucson mother of cats, here's an issue that is neither theoretical nor extreme. More and more people believe, as PETA does, that even if it would lead to a cure for cancer or AIDS, it would be wrong to experiment on animals. In fact, many animal rights advocates believe that even to save a human life, it would be wrong to kill a pig to obtain a heart valve. The 20th century showed vividly what happens to human worth when Judeo-Christian values are abandoned. Nazi Germany and the various communist regimes all rejected Judeo-Christian values and ended up slaughtering the largest number of people in human history. For Nazism, Jews and members of other non-Aryan groups were declared worthless and murdered in the millions. For communists, human worth was determined solely by communist parties which murdered tens of millions of people. 
Only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could Nazis declare Jews, Slavs, and others subhuman. And only by rejecting Judeo-Christian values could communist regimes slaughter those they called class enemies. Individual human life meant nothing. Meanwhile, human slavery was abolished only in the Judeo-Christian world. And of course, for nearly all those who reject Judeo-Christian values, the human fetus is worthless, if its mother deems it so. Finally, there is an increasingly vocal part of the environmentalist movement that also denigrates human worth. For these individuals, the human being is not infinitely precious. Trees and rivers and mountains are. So, are you more valuable than a dog or a cat or a tree? That depends on your value system. I'm Dennis Prager. One of the most important differences between the left and the right is how each regards the role and the size of the government. The left believes that the state should be the most powerful force in society. Among many other things, the government should be in control of educating every child, should provide all health care, and should regulate often to the minutest detail how businesses conduct their business. In Germany, for instance, the government legislates the time of day stores have to close. In short, there should ideally be no power that competes with government. Not parents, not businesses, not private schools, not religious institutions, not even the individual human conscience. Conservatives, on the other hand, believe the government's role in society should be limited to absolute necessities, such as national defense, and to being the resource of last resort to help citizens who cannot be helped by family, by community, or by religious and secular charities. Conservatives understand that as governments grow in size and power, the following will inevitably happen. One, there will be ever-increasing amounts of corruption. Power and money breed corruption. People in government will sell government influence for personal and political gain, and people outside government will seek to buy influence and favors. In Africa and Latin America, government corruption has been the single biggest factor holding nations back from progressing. Two, individual liberty will decline. With a few exceptions, such as an unrestricted right to abortion, individual liberty is less important to the left than to the right. This is neither an opinion nor a criticism. It is simple logic. The more control the government has over people's lives, the less liberty people have. Three, countries with ever-expanding governments will either reduce the size of their government or eventually collapse economically. Every welfare state ultimately becomes a Ponzi scheme, relying on new payers to pay previous payers. And when it runs out of the new payers, the scheme collapses. All the welfare states of the world, including wealthy European countries, are already experiencing this problem to varying degrees. Four, in order to pay for an ever-expanding government, taxes are constantly increased. But at a given level of taxation, the society's wealth producers will either stop working, work less, hire fewer people, or move their business out of the state or out of the country. Five, big government produces big deficits and ever-increasing and ultimately unsustainable debt. This, too, is only logical. The more money the state hands out, the more money people will demand from the state. No recipient of free money has ever said, thank you, I have enough. Unless big governments get smaller, they will all eventually collapse under their own weight, with terrible consequences socially as well as economically. Six, 
The bigger the government, the greater the opportunities for doing great evil. The 20th century was the most murderous century in recorded history. And who did all this killing? Big governments. Evil individuals without power can do only so much harm. But when evil individuals take control of a big government, the amount of harm they can do is essentially unlimited. The right fears big government. The left fears big business. But Coca-Cola can't break into your house or confiscate your wealth. Only big government can do that. As irresponsible as any big business has ever been, it is only big government that can build concentration camps and commit genocide. Seven. Big government eats away at the moral character of a nation. People no longer take care of other people. After all, they know the government will do that. That's why Americans give far more of their money and volunteer far more of their time to charity than do Europeans at the same economic level. Without the belief in an ever-expanding government, there is no left. Without a belief in limited government, there is no right. I'm Dennis Prager. The United States is the world's most prosperous economy. It's been that way for so long, over a hundred years, that we take it for granted. But how did it happen? There are many answers, of course. One is that the United States values the free market over government control of the economy. But here's a point that is seldom made. It didn't begin that way. Before the country placed its trust in the free market, it trusted the government to make important business decisions. Or to put it another way, only after the government failed repeatedly to promote economic growth, and only after private enterprise succeeded where the government failed, did the United States start to develop a world-beating economy. Let's look at three telling examples. In 1808, John Jacob Astor formed the American Fur Company and marketed American furs around the world. Europeans adored beaver hats for their peerless warmth and durability. Astor gave them what they wanted. Instead of leaving the fur business to capable entrepreneurs like Astor, the government decided it wanted to be in on the action. So it subsidized its own fur company run by a self-promoting government official named Thomas McKinney. McKinney should have won the competition. After all, he had the federal government backing him. But while Astor employed hundreds of people and still made a tidy profit, McKinney's company lost money every year. Finally, Congress, in 1822, came to its senses and ended the subsidies for McKinney and his associates. A similar situation developed in the 1840s around the telegraph. The telegraph was the first step toward the instant communication we have today. Invented by Samuel Morse, the telegraph transmitted sound as dots and dashes representing letters of the alphabet. Morse, more of an idealist than a businessman, agreed to let the government own and operate the telegraph in the national interest. But the government steadily lost money each month it operated the telegraph. During 1845, expenditures for the telegraph exceeded revenue by 6 to 1 and sometimes by 10 to 1. Seeing no value in the invention, Congress turned the money loser over to private enterprise. In the hands of entrepreneurs, the business took off. Telegraph promoters showed the press how it could instantly report stories occurring hundreds of miles away. Bankers, stockbrokers, and insurance companies saw how they could instantly monitor investments near and far. As the quality of service improved, telegraph lines were strung across the country from 40 miles of wire in 1846 to 23,000 miles in 1852. By the 1860s, the U.S. had a transcontinental telegraph wire. And by the end of that decade, entrepreneurs had strung a telegraph cable across the Atlantic Ocean. Why didn't the U.S. government profitably use what Morse had invented? Part of the answer is that the incentives for bureaucrats differ sharply from those of entrepreneurs. 
When government operated the telegraph, Washington bureaucrats received no profits from the messages they sent. And the cash they lost was the taxpayers, not their own. So government officials had no incentive to improve service, to find new customers, or to expand to more cities. But entrepreneurs like Ezra Cornell, the founder of Western Union, did. Cheaper, better service meant more customers and more profits. Just 15 years after Congress privatized the telegraph, both the costs of construction and the rates for service linking the major cities were as little as one-tenth of the original rates established by Washington. In the steamship business, we see the story repeated yet again. During the 1840s, regular steamship travel began between New York and England. The government placed its bets on shipowner Edward Collins, a man more skilled at political lobbying than at business. While Congress funded Collins, Cornelius Vanderbilt started his own steamship company. Vanderbilt cut the costs of travel, filled his ships with eager passengers, and built a fabulously successful business, soon leaving Collins in his wake. Collins failed because he didn't feel a need to improve or even provide safe and regular service. For example, two of his four ships sank, killing hundreds of passengers. If he lost money, there was always another politician to appeal to. Vanderbilt, in contrast, had to serve his customers or he would have lost his company. You'd think we would have learned our lesson by now. Economic prosperity comes from free enterprise, not from government subsidies. But it's a lesson we have to learn every generation. I'm Burton Folsom professor of history at Hillsdale College for Prager University. A major difference between the right and the left concerns the way each seeks to improve society. Conservatives believe that the way to a better society is almost always through the moral improvement of the individual by each person doing battle with his or her own weaknesses and flaws. It is true that in violent and evil societies such as fascist, communist, or Islamist tyrannies, the individual must be preoccupied with battling outside forces. Almost everywhere else, though, certainly in a free and decent country such as America, the greatest battle of the individual must be with inner forces, that is, with his or her moral failings. The left, on the other hand, believes that the way to a better society is almost always through doing battle with society's moral failings. Thus, in America, the left concentrates its efforts on combating sexism, racism, intolerance, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and the many other evils that the left believes permeate American society. One important consequence of this left-right distinction is that those on the left are far more preoccupied with politics than those on the right. Since the left is so much more interested in fixing society than in fixing the individual, politics inevitably becomes the vehicle for societal improvement. That's why whenever the term activist is used, we almost always assume that the term refers to someone on the left. Another consequence of this left-right difference is that since conservatives believe society has changed one person at a time, they accept that change happens gradually. This isn't fast enough for the left, which is always and everywhere focused on social revolution. An excellent example of this was a statement by the then presidential candidate Barack Obama just days before his first election in 2008. To a rapturous audience, he declared, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Conservatives not only have no interest in fundamentally transforming the United States of America, they are strongly opposed to doing so. Conservatives understand that fundamentally transforming any society that isn't fundamentally bad, not to mention transforming what is one of the most decent societies in history, can only make the society worse. 
Conservatives believe that America can be improved, but should not be transformed, let alone fundamentally transformed. The founders of the United States recognized that the transformation that every generation must work on is the moral transformation of each citizen. Thus, character development was at the core of both child rearing and of young people's education from elementary school through college. As John Adams, the second president said, our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And in the words of Benjamin Franklin, only a virtuous people are capable of freedom. Why is that? Because freedom requires self-control. The freer the society, the more self-control is necessary. If the majority of people don't control themselves, the state, meaning an ever more powerful government, will have to control them. From the founding of the United States until the 1960s, schools and parents concentrated on character education. But with the ascent of left-wing ideas, character education has all but disappeared from American schools. Instead, children are taught not to focus on their flaws, but on America's. Social issues have replaced character education. An example is a new K-12 science curriculum, the next generation of science standards, which will teach young Americans starting in kindergarten about global warming. And when they get to college, American young people will be taught about the need to fight economic inequality, white privilege, and the alleged rape culture on their campuses. Ironically, if there really is a rape culture that permeates American college campuses, the only reason would have to be that there was so little character education in our schools, or for that matter, at home. Fathers and religion, historically the two primary conveyors of self-control, are non-existent in the lives of millions of American children. We are now producing vast numbers of Americans who are passionate about fixing America while doing next to nothing about fixing their own character. The problem, however, is that you can't make society better unless you first make its people better. I'm Dennis Prager. Do you believe in free speech? Do you believe that people should be judged by their character, not their skin color? Do you believe in freedom of religion? If you believe these things, you're probably not a progressive. You might think you're a progressive. I used to think I was. My show, The Rubin Report, was originally part of the Progressive Young Turks Network. Progressives struck me as liberals but louder. Progressives were the nice guys. They looked out for the little guy. They cared about women and minorities. They embraced change. In short, who wouldn't want to be a progressive? But over the last couple of years, the meaning of the word progressive has changed. Progressives used to say, I may disagree with what you say, but I'll fight to the death for your right to say it. Not anymore. Banning speakers whose opinions you don't agree with from college campuses, that's not progressive. Prohibiting any words not approved of as politically correct, that's not progressive. Putting trigger warnings on books, movies, music, anything that might offend people, that's not progressive either. All of this has led me to believe that much of the left is no longer progressive, but regressive. This is one of the reasons I've spent so much time on my show talking about the regressive left. This regressive ideology doesn't judge people as individuals, but as a collective. If you're black or female or Muslim or Hispanic or member of any other minority group, you're judged differently than the most evil of all things, a white Christian male. The regressive left ranks minority groups in a pecking order to compete in a kind of oppression Olympics. Gold medal goes to the most offended. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream that his children would be judged by their character and not their skin color was a liberal idea, but these days it's not a progressive ideal.
And what about religious freedom, the idea that no one else can tell you what you have to believe? Surely progressives still support that basic right. Well, not so much. I'm a married gay man, so you might think that I appreciate the government forcing a Christian baker or photographer or florist to act against their religion in order to cater, photograph, or decorate my wedding. But you'd be wrong. A government that can force Christians to violate their conscience can force me to violate mine. If a baker won't bake you a cake, find another baker. Don't demand that the state tell him what to do with his private business. I'm pro-choice, but a government that can force a group of Catholic nuns, literally called the Little Sisters of the Poor, to violate their faith and pay for abortion-inducing birth control can force anyone to do anything. That's not progressive, that's regressive. Today's progressivism has become a faux moral movement hurling charges of racism, bigotry, xenophobia, homophobia, Islamophobia, and a slew of other meaningless buzzwords at anyone they disagree with. The battle of ideas has been replaced by a battle of feelings, and outrage has replaced honesty. Diversity reigns supreme as long as it's not that pesky diversity of thought. This isn't the recipe for a free society, it's a recipe for authoritarianism. For these reasons, I can no longer call myself a progressive. I don't really call myself a Democrat either. I'm a classical liberal, a free thinker, and as much as I don't like to admit it, defending my liberal values has suddenly become a conservative position. So if you think people should be able to say what they think without being punished for it, that people should be judged by their behavior, not their skin color, and that people should be able to live the way that they want to live without government interference, then there's not much left on the left for you. I'll keep trying to explain that to progressives until I'm totally left out. I'm Dave Rubin of The Rubin Report for Prager University. At the core of left-wing thought is a denial of painful realities, the denial of what the French call Les faits de la vie, facts of life. Conservatives, on the other hand, are all too aware of the painful realities of life and base many of their positions on them. One example of this left-right difference is the differing attitudes toward human nature and responsibility for evil. When liberals blame violent crime on poverty, one reason they do is that ever since the Enlightenment, the left has posited that human nature is good. So then, when people do bad things to other people, the left argues that some outside forces, usually poverty, and in the case of non-white criminals, racism, are responsible, not human nature. Why? Because people on the left find it too painful to look reality in the eye and acknowledge that human nature is deeply flawed. Another fact of life that the left finds too painful to acknowledge is the existence of profound differences between men and women. There is no other explanation for the denial of what has been obvious to every previous generation in history, that men and women are inherently different. This denial is certainly not the result of scientific inquiry. The more science learns about the male brain and the female brain, not to mention male and female hormones, the more it confirms important built-in differences between the sexes. Yet many people, influenced by left-wing thought, believe that girls are as happy to play with trucks as are boys, and boys are as happy to play with dolls and tea sets as are girls. Why do they believe such silliness? Because acknowledging many of those differences is painful. For example, feminists and others on the left do not want to acknowledge that men are far more capable of having emotionally meaningless sex than women. Therefore, feminism has taught generations of young women that they are just as capable of enjoying emotionless sex with many partners as are men. The fact is that the great majority of women are deeply dissatisfied with the hookup culture and yearn to bond with a man even more than they yearn for professional success. But feminism came up with the famous and false phrase, a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle, to counter the painful reality that most women feel incomplete without a man in their life, just as I might add, most men feel incomplete without a woman. 
Ironically, however, most men have no trouble acknowledging this. This is what the notion of political incorrectness is all about. The very definition of politically incorrect is a truth that people on the left find too painful to acknowledge and therefore do not want expressed. To cite yet another example, why are many young black males in prison? The reason is too painful for the left to acknowledge, and therefore it is politically incorrect to say it. Young black males commit a disproportionate amount of violent crime. And why are there speech codes on virtually all college campuses? Because the left doesn't want to hear facts or opinions that cause them pain. That's why the left developed what it calls trigger warnings. A trigger warning, as defined by the Oxford Dictionary, is, quote, a statement at the start of a piece of writing, video, etc., alerting the reader or viewer to the fact that it contains potentially distressing material, unquote. That's why the left constantly speaks about being made uncomfortable and about feeling offended. Being made uncomfortable or feeling offended is, after all, painful. Take the left-wing bumper sticker idea, war is not the answer. The painful truth is that war is often the only answer to great evil. Nazi death camps were liberated by soldiers fighting a war, not by peace activists or by peaceful dialogue with the German regime. But having to acknowledge the moral necessity of war is too painful a truth for many on the left. One might say that leftism appeals to those who wish to remain innocent. Growing up and facing the fact that life is messy, difficult, and painful is increasingly a conservative point of view. I'm Dennis Prager. Do you ever look at the lives of people around you and say, man, I wish that was me? You know you do. Everybody does. But I bet you never compared yourself to me. Haven't heard of me? I do have my own TV show, In the Middle of the Night. When I started, I wanted to be as big as Jerry Seinfeld. I'm not. And yet, I'm a pretty happy guy. Here's why. I stopped comparing myself to other people. Seriously, that's the whole trick. Here's what I mean. If my happiness were based on being the biggest comedian in the business, I'd be mad at whoever was getting more Netflix specials than me. I have zero. If it were based on having the best TV ratings, I'd be mad at Jimmy Fallon. He beats me every night. And if it were based on being rich, I'd be mad at a lot of people. And even if I were rich, really rich, like number 10 on the Forbes 400 rich, I'd be mad that there were nine other people richer than me. It never ends. Comparing yourself to others creates a totally unrealistic measure for what constitutes success. And I know, because the entertainment business is all about unrealistic expectations. All through my career, I'd meet with satisfied customers after my shows and they'd say, hey, you're good. Maybe someday you'll be successful like Jerry Seinfeld. He's the measure of success? The top guy? When someone tells you they're a doctor, you don't say, well, maybe someday you'll cure a disease and save millions of lives, just like Jonas Salk did for polio. Or a lawyer. Oh, wow, so what's your ultimate goal? The Supreme Court? Do you see how crazy that sounds? Professional success is about making a living, pursuing excellence, and finding meaning in what you do. When I first started doing stand-up, I was a nobody. It took more than a decade playing in front of tuned-out crowds before it started paying the bills. 10 years is a lot of time to tell jokes for no money to people who aren't laughing. In those days, I spent a lot of time thinking about the comedians I admired, the guys at the top. I wanted those big sold out houses I wasn't playing, the big paydays I wasn't making, the TV specials I wasn't doing, and not just their success, their talent. I'd look at comics like George Carlin, Robin Williams, and Louis C.K., they were all able to turn their dark, personal struggles into brilliant comedy. I envy their talent, but I wouldn't want the dark, personal struggles that went along with it. 
If you don't factor in everything about whoever you're comparing yourself to, you're playing a sort of mix and match game that doesn't exist in the real world. Here's one of life's little truths. Everyone is a package deal. You can't view one element of someone else's life in isolation. That's cheating. You can't say, I want Louis C.K.'s money and fame, Jay Leno's car collection, and Tom Shalhoub's wife and kids. That person doesn't exist. If he did, he'd be pretty cool. I would definitely want to hang with him. Everyone has pain in their lives. Think of anybody who you know really well. You know the awful stuff they've had to deal with, the demons they battle. How many dead rock stars, movie stars, and yes, comedians does it take to convince us all that everyone's life is hard? Face it, you really don't want someone else's life. You want your own life, only better. But that's the thing. You can make your life better by not doing something. Comparing yourself to other people. Back when I was a nobody, I wanted to sell out the biggest venues and have a primetime TV show with millions of viewers. Now I sell out small venues, and I'm on in the middle of the night with half a million viewers. And I appreciate every one of them. I guess when I compare myself now to myself then, I'm doing okay. You should try it. I'm Tom Shalhoub for Prager University. The left and the right view America and its history very differently. Conservatives view America as President Abraham Lincoln viewed it as the last best hope of Earth. While acknowledging America's flaws, conservatives regard America as the best society ever created, giving more people of more backgrounds, more freedom, more opportunity, and more affluence than any other society, and doing more good for more people in other countries than any society in history. The left, on the other hand, sees America as having been and continuing to be a very flawed country, morally no better than many and morally inferior to many. The left's view is that America was founded by rich white males who were intent on protecting their race, their wealth, and in many cases, their slaves. America was and remains sexist, intolerant, xenophobic, and bigoted a country of unacceptable material inequality where the super-rich and big corporations have far too much power and influence. The further left one goes, the more negative the assessment of America. Here's a telling example. On my radio show, I once dialogued with Howard Zinn, arguably the most influential American historian of the second half of the 20th century. Here is one part of our dialogue. Professor Zinn said, if people knew history, they would scoff at the idea that the United States is a force for the betterment of humanity. When I said that America has done more good for humanity than any other country, Professor Zinn responded, America has, quote, probably done more bad than good, unquote. For the left, the moral flaws in American history are enormous, but all the unique good America has done, both in America and abroad, is minimized or ignored. Take the example of slavery. This terrible institution is the most widely cited proof of American evil. The problem with that judgment, however, is that every civilization in world history, even including African societies, practiced slavery, often on a far larger scale than America did. But there are two other questions about slavery that must be asked in order to make a moral judgment about America. The first is, which societies were the first to abolish slavery? Since all societies had slavery, that is a far more important question to ask than who had slaves. It turns out that all the societies that first abolished slavery were rooted in the Jewish and Christian Bibles, and among them was the United States. The second question that needs to be answered is this. Was America morally better than other societies in just about every other regard? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. America gradually became the least racist, least xenophobic country in the world. In no country do people of every race and ethnicity become accepted as full members of the society as do immigrants to America. 
And no country in history has fought for the liberty of others as much as America has. That is why, for example, 37,000 Americans died in Korea, a country that offered America no economic gain. The purpose was to protect Koreans from communist tyranny. Today, South Korea, where American troops are still stationed, is one of the wealthiest and freest countries in Asia. Meanwhile, North Korea, the part of the Korean peninsula that America did not succeed in liberating, is the least free and poorest country on earth. Without America, people around the world would suffer from far more tyranny, enslavement, and genocide. The countries where American troops have remained long after their combat ceased, Germany, Japan, and South Korea, have prospered economically and morally. Countries that America abandoned, such as Vietnam and Iraq, experienced mass murder and other horrors. The left, however, views nearly all of America's wars since 1945 as expressions of superpower imperialism. Days before the 2008 American presidential election, the Democratic candidate, then-Senator Barack Obama, announced, quote, we are five days away from fundamentally transforming the United States of America. Exactly so. The left wants to fundamentally transform America, the right doesn't. Conservatives want to conserve America's unique greatness and improve it where necessary, but not transform it. If America is fundamentally transformed, it will not become better than other nations. It will become like other nations. I'm Dennis Prager. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. Have you ever heard that thrilling line, do you even know who Paul Revere is? If you're under, say, 30, I'm going to guess that the answer to both of these questions might be no. This is a very serious problem, but it's not your fault. It's a serious problem because it means you've been cut off from one of our greatest American stories. And it's not your fault because no one bothered to teach you about this courageous man and the great American poet who made him famous. It seems professional educators decided that other topics were more important to your education. But they made a mistake, a big one. The story of Paul Revere is part of our heritage. It and countless other stories like it unite us as a distinct people with a shared noble past. They also inspire us and stir national pride. These are good things, vital to the future of the country. Without them, we're just 300 million different individuals living between Canada and Mexico. It wasn't always this way. In fact, not long ago, you couldn't have left high school without memorizing the line I quoted and many of the lines that follow. So let me write a wrong and tell you about two remarkable Americans who lived half a century apart one a silversmith and one a poet, Paul Revere and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. By 1775, the American colonists and their British masters were on the verge of war. The flashpoint was Boston. It wasn't so much a matter of where the British would strike, but when. To give themselves some advance warning, the rebels created a team of couriers. One of them was a successful 40-year-old silversmith and engraver named Paul Revere. On the night of April 18th, two lanterns were lit in the tallest structure in the city, the Old North Church. This was the signal that the fateful moment had arrived. The British were coming. Revere rode out into the darkness to warn his compatriots to prepare for a fight. That fight came the next day in Lexington. The War of American Independence had begun. But in the decades following, history mostly forgot Paul Revere. After serving in the war, he had an extraordinary career as an early industrialist, building a significant business that survives to this day as Revere Copper. But when he died in 1818, his obituary made no mention of his daring ride. The only reason we still know of him is because of another crisis in American history, 
the Civil War. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow had been an ardent opponent of slavery, an abolitionist, from the time he was a young man. By 1860, he was America's most famous poet. An epic struggle was coming, one that would again determine the future of the nation. He anxiously wondered whether the people of the northern states would be up to the challenge that lay ahead. What might he do to inspire them? Longfellow remembered a story he'd read many years before about Revere's ride. He recreated it with consummate skill. As you read his glorious poem, you can almost hear the thundering hooves of the silversmith's horse. Published in a new magazine called The Atlantic Monthly in January 1861, his brilliant ballad was an immediate success. School children began memorizing and reciting it at annual Independence Day celebrations. In 1883, a 22-year-old sculptor, Cyrus Dallin, was commissioned to create a Paul Revere statue to stand in the plaza across from the Old North Church. It is still one of the most popular tourist sites in Boston. What is Longfellow's poem asking of us who hear it today? It is doing what all great art does. It calls us to think of ourselves as part of something larger, as part of something noble, beautiful, good, and true. The men like Paul Revere who fought in the American Revolution were not merely fighting for themselves and for their families, but for something far beyond that, for a new kind of nation. The men who fought to free the slaves in the Civil War renewed that promise. If we forget these brave men, we forget what they stood for and therefore we will forget what America means. And just like an individual who's lost his memory no longer knows who he is, a nation or a people that loses its memory no longer knows who they are. Longfellow's poem reminds us. So go read Paul Revere's Ride by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I promise you'll be glad you did. It begins like this. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the midnight ride of Paul Revere. I'm Eric Metaxas, author of If You Can Keep It, The Forgotten Promise of American Liberty for Prager University. Thank you for watching this video. To help keep PragerU videos free, please consider making a tax-deductible donation.